Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual public meeting to talk about the accelerated approval program at the Food and Drug Administration. My name is Susan Winkler, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer at the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA, and we are so pleased to host today's event. I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping announcements just to take us through the next few hours. Um, I'll note that because of the meeting size, attendee cameras and microphones will remain off throughout the meeting. Uh, also note that the workshop is being recorded, and that provides us the, avail the ability rather to have the slide deck, the recording, and the transcript available on the Reagan Udall Foundation website on Monday. That is reaganudall.org. I'll also then Let's talk a little bit about our agenda. Uh, we have the next three hours packed for you. And so a quick overview and highlight, we are going to start with an presentations from FDA to look back at the last 30 years since the accelerated approval pathway was created by Congress. Um, then we're going to turn to learn about the real world implications of accelerated approval from patients as well as in a discussion with providers, payers, and regulated industry. Now, as we jump into this discussion, I wanna walk you through a bit of a visual to ground us all in what it is that we're gonna talk about in the accelerated approval pathway. So today's discussion, if we go to the next slide, is about, there are many, we know there are many different ways to expedite the review of drugs and biologics and, and other regulated products at FDA. But today we're focusing on specifically the accelerated approval pathway. Now this here is something that we call an infographic at the foundation, but we recognize that it's an infographic for those who are deep in uh, the understanding of various FDA processes. But it's structured here to help us compare the traditional pathway for approval, and then to see how that might compare timing-wise and process-wise with the accelerated path. So this is just a visual way to think through what we'll be talking about in the next three sessions. Um, one note, and you'll hear this again and again, but to remind us that accelerated approval uses an identifiable surrogate endpoint that's considered reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. So for example, in oncology, the surrogate endpoint may be tumor shrinkage, which is reasonably likely to predict increased survival. So this, um, we'll be posting this infographic and kind of walking through things um, to better understand how one moves through the process, but you move from left to right in having the application come through the agency. And then you'll see while you have confirmatory trials that are required, FDA review, and then um, of those confirmatory trials, and then either a stay on the market and convert to a, a conditional approval, rather to a full approval, or to be withdrawn from the market or have the indication removed from the labeling. So this is the rough high level non-FDA um, uh, visual to show what it is that the agency walks through. So for all of our visual learners that you have a bit of a sense of how to walk through each of those processes. Um, with that, I'm going to step out of the way to turn to the official discussion and presentation where we will hear specifically from three experts at the agency to talk about the accelerated approval process and pathway and where we've come from the 1992 origins to now here 2022, 30 years later. So our first presentation will be from Dr. Jacqueline corrigan Karai, who is the Principal Deputy Center Director at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at FDA. Um, Dr. corrigan Karai, would you come on camera and unmute so that we can hear from you and um, introduce us to um, this first part of our programming. Great, thank you and, and welcome everyone. I'm going to take control and I'll start my slides. I just wanna thank everyone for, for coming and joining us for this review of accelerated approval and where we've been. And I've also wanted to thank our panelists for coming and sharing their time and expertise and especially to our patient panelists who really have agreed to come here and share some more personal experiences. Finally, thank you, Susan, and everyone at the Reagan Udall Foundation who have made this possible. 
I am the, uh, as Susan said, the principal deputy center director for the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. But as I go through my slides, uh, what you'll see is really um, applicable not only to the Center uh, for Drugs, but also uh, to our Center for Biologics. So let me, oh, sorry, um, sometimes uh, technology gets ahead of me. Okay, so let's jump in here. What I'd like to do is just spend a couple of time, uh, minutes making sure you understand just the drug approval standard and sort of endpoints as uh, for all of our approvals. And then we'll jump in a little bit more, a deeper dive on accelerated approval, which is what we're here to do. So to approve a drug, FDA needs to find that first there's substantial evidence of effectiveness. And the statutory definition of substantial evidence is that we have adequate and well-controlled investigations, including clinical investigations, that on the basis of which it could fairly and responsibly be concluded by such experts that the drug will have the effect it purports or is represented to have under the conditions of use prescribed, recommended, or suggested. And subsequent court cases have confirmed that the experts who make that decision on substantial evidence is the FDA. That's not the only thing we need. We then need to go and make sure that we're approving a drug whereby the benefits of that drug outweigh the risk. So it's a two-part standard. What we'll be really focusing on is that first part and that evidence. So let me go to my next slide. I'm sorry. So the most straightforward, of course, when we approve a drug, we're looking at, is that drug affecting a clinical endpoint? Is it doing something? Is it improving the clinical status of that patient? And that may be a very straightforward assessment on something that we can all agree improves survival or reduced occurrence of some event that we think will, will decrease survival, you know, multiple hospitalizations, organ failure, or, and a little bit more challenging, can we really have a measurement of how the patient feels or functions? And often, uh, for some diseases that are chronic and progressive, it means we have to develop a detailed stepwise data-driven approach to ensure that whatever endpoint is measuring aspects of disease are important to patients, are sensitive to change with the intervention, and provides an accurate and reliable assessment across populations. So we developed those clinical endpoints, but when you look at different diseases, sometimes trying to get the evidence that a drug will uh, make an impact on some of these endpoints can take a while, but it's important. Nonetheless, for certain serious and life-threatening diseases without adequate therapies, we know that there's an urgency to get effective and safe therapeutics to patients. And in certain cases, if we have sufficient understanding of the disease, we can identify a surrogate endpoint or an intermediate clinical endpoint that occurs earlier in the course of that disease. And it's not a, clinically, a clinical outcome per se, but it is predictive of that clinical outcome. And what that does is it creates an opportunity for a more streamlined development program by enabling trials that can be shorter, and in certain cases, smaller. And then what we can get is we can get greater access to the drug as we confirm benefits. So let's talk about surrogate endpoints. When we're using surrogate endpoints, we're usually talking about a lab measure, a radiographic image, a physical sign, or other measure that in of itself, as I said, is not a direct measure of clinical benefit, but is predictive. And the data that supports that conclusion, that linkage, it can be epidemiologic, therapeutic, pathophysiologic, or other scientific evidence, and often it's more than one. And the way that we use a surrogate endpoint in approving a drug really depends upon the, le the strength of the evidence. So in certain cases, we have what we call validated surrogate. We have sufficient evidence that we know that that marker is going to predict clinical benefit. So for example, we know that if we keep your blood pressure at a, a good you know, 120 over 80 or less, we're gonna reduce your risk of stroke. We don't have to run a blood pressure trial and look for stroke. We can look at blood pressure. We know that forced expiratory volume in certain pulmonary diseases is going to predict clinical benefits. In other cases, where we have some evidence, it's robust evidence, but it's not quite certain evidence. It's what we call reasonably likely. And in those cases, it is what we call, it is a surrogate that we might use in accelerated approval, sort of like 
total kidney volume in polycystic kidney disease, or clearance of amyloid plaque in Alzheimer's, which we recently used. So what we have is two pathways that we can use. We can use what we call traditional approval, and that's where we're going to rely on a clinical endpoint or validated surrogate if one's available. But if we have a reasonably likely surrogate or an intermediate clinical endpoint, we can go down the accelerated approval pathway. And the, the sort of citations at the bottom are the regs um, to find out a little bit more. So this is what Congress told us. It told us that, and it's repetitive of what I've said, that for those serious and life-threatening diseases, if you have a surrogate, that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit or a clinical endpoint that's measured early than irreversible morbidity or mortality, you can make this approval under accelerated approval, taking into account the rarity, severity, prevalence of the condition, and the availability or lack of alternative treatment. So this is not used in every case. Congress also put some limitations on the use. It said, the approval of products under this subsection may be subject to one or both of the following requirements. One is that the sponsor conduct appropriate post-approval studies to verify the describe and describe the predicted effect on irreversible morbidity, mortality, or other clinical benefit. And two, that the sponsor submit copies of promotional materials related to the product. I'm not going to read everything during the pre-approval review period and following approval for such period. FDA routinely requires those post-approval studies. We know we need to verify that benefit and we do do special review of promotional materials. So the framework we operate on allows us to approve a drug for a serious and life-threatening disease for which there are not adequate therapies based on adequate and well-controlled clinical trials or clinical investigations, so the same ones we would do for traditional approval that demonstrate now that the drug has a significant effect on either the surrogate endpoint that's reasonably likely or this intermediate clinical endpoint. What does that mean? That means that there is going to be uncertainty regarding whether the drug will actually impact a clinical outcome at the time of approval. Such uncertainty is resolved with a post-approval study that is conducted. And uncertainty by definition means that not every study will confirm benefit. And so failure to confirm benefit can result in withdrawal of the drug. Now you may ask, why would we subject those with the most serious and life-threatening diseases to uncertainty? And you must remember that accelerated approval is only going to be used when there's an assessment that there's not an adequate available therapy for these diseases. And so when we look back at 30 years of accelerated approval, we might want to look and remind ourselves how we got here. So this was the beginning, right? This was the AIDS epidemic when, you know, we really didn't have treatments. And in 1992, after the first approval of an HIV drug, we issued accelerated approval regulations and then approved under accelerated approval, the first drug, uh, Zalcitabin for HIV. And now in December 21, we had 307 accelerated approvals across the Center for Drugs and the Center for Biologics. And let's make this a little bit personal. This was actually recently published in the New York Times by Dr. Greg Gonzalez. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He wrote an opinion piece about the danger of declaring the pandemic over too soon. But he wrote about the early 90s and being in many ways the most terrible of their first years of the AIDS epidemic. And research on the disease was in high gear, but drug after drug failed to stop HIV. Funerals for friends and families in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s continued unabated. And many of us at risk for getting sick had given up hope of a normal life. My friends and I, most of us were a few years out of college living in the moment because we weren't sure how much time we had left. He told of his cousin, Carl, dying of AIDS in 19, lymphoma in 1995, and he himself finding out he was HIV positive and wondering what his fate would be. And then he said about getting lucky that in 1996, a new generation of treatments called protease inhibitors emerged and were able to control HIV. And doctors talked about a Lazarus effect, watching their patients go from near death to health. He enrolled in a clinical trial and started drugs and, and says he's alive. What you have on the right is the protease inhibitors that were approved under accelerated approval in 1990. And this was when you know access was done earlier until we 
validated the surrogate endpoint for HIV that we were using at that time, viral load. This is not all the drugs approved under accelerated approval in the time frame. There was others from other classes, but for the purpose of the slide, I just include the protease. So our requirements are a reasonably likely surrogate, which requires that robust data set to support that it provides a clean clinical benefit, a post-marketing confirmatory trial to verify the anticipated clinical benefit. We also require that the indication statement and the labeling disclose that approval is based on a surrogate and clinical benefit is to be confirmed. We have special review of promotional materials and ultimately approval may be withdrawn if trials fail to verify clinical benefit. So where are we? So this is a snapshot of um, FDA's accelerated approval. And as you can see back in the 90s, you can see this non-oncology or in gray, uh, in, which represents a lot of the drugs for HIV, and then sort of an explosion in the uh, accelerated approvals for oncology from about 2012 onward, and also hematology. And when you think about why is that? Well, a key driver was a scientific advancement in oncology and understanding genetic, molecular, and immunomodulatory drivers in the 90s and 2000s, and my colleague from oncology can speak more to that. The discovery of molecular mechanisms, targeted therapeutics, biomarkers to support decision-making, and the establishment of surrogate endpoints that could be used to support approval decisions. And many of these drugs were transformative, and I've just listed a couple, then there are many more. But what I wanted to list is illustrated is what it means for years of access prior to a traditional approval, what that means to patients. So accelerated approval, of course, is not without challenges. Everything has challenges. I think one challenge is there are many diseases where we have unmet needs that are very serious and life-threatening, and yet uh, there's sometimes just limited pathogenesis of what's leading to those disease complications and progressions and the data to support a relationship between a surrogate endpoint, if we can identify one, and clinical benefits is limited, as well as information critical to establishing a biomarker. And while we may have animal models, if they're not fully recapitulating key aspects of the disease, they're not translational, they are not, they hamper us in finding these surrogate endpoints that we can use. So one challenge is we may not be able to use it in the diseases where we know we would, might like to use it. Second challenge is once a drug is on the market, if the confirmatory trials are not ongoing at the time of approval, there really can be challenges to conducting those trials that are needed to confirm clinical benefit. Because again, we're entering this drug in a field where there's unmet need. And the framework is built among, around greater access with more uncertainty, and therefore we can expect that there will be some failures. But for diseases with few or no alternative therapies, many patients may feel they are personally benefiting, even when we have well-designed trials demonstrating no clinical benefit and there can be toxicity. And the withdrawal procedure, which is described in statute as follows, the secretary may withdraw approval of a product approved under accelerated approval using expedited procedures as prescribed by the secretary and regulations, which shall include an opportunity for informal hearing. As you'll hear from my colleague, um, Dr. Fain, in practice, it's really not that expedited and the hearings are not informal per se. Nonetheless, despite these challenges, I think overall we're doing good well. So this is a snapshot of CEDAR accelerated approvals from 92 to 2021. In the darker blue, you see those that are what we call converted. So we have the confirmatory studies. In the uh, light green, those are the not yet converted. And you see a, a sort of focus of light green on the right in the more recent approvals. And then the turquoise are the withdrawn. And if we wanna look back and say, well, you know, let's look at our older ones. Have they all been converted? No, they have not all been converted. 80% uh, have converted, 14% have withdrawn, and six uh, are not yet converted. I would mention that not everything withdrawn means that it was a failure. Some of these, for example, there's a handful in here that are antibiotics that were approved for inhalational anthrax, and uh, there was never a confirmatory study in that setting, which is probably a good thing. Fever, oops, sorry. I just wanted to show 
some of the statistics. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this computer. With CBER, so CBER has is has not used it as as much as uh, CBER, but again, you see a similar sort of pattern. The not yet converted are the more recent ones, 18 to 21. Uh, and when you look back 10 years, 88% converted, 7%, which is really just one, is withdrawn, and 7% one is not yet converted. So in sum, I would say accelerated approval continues to be an important pathway for serious and life-threatening diseases with inadequate therapeutic options when we've identified an appropriate surrogate that are reasonably likely. And as we've seen in oncology and certain other diseases, but it remains a challenge in many diseases with unmet needs because of the underlying pathology is not well understood and the models to identify surrogates are lacking. We know that with greater uncertainty comes greater risk of failed therapies and where should that line be drawn in terms of reasonably likely. And we also know that in the face of unmet medical need, removing any therapy is challenging. Finally, a failed study can occur for reasons that do not negate that the surrogate is reasonably likely, making it even more complex. But finally, I think providing access and completing confirmatory trials expeditiously is how we best serve patients. So I'd like to thank my colleagues for their contributions, and I will turn it back to Susan. Thank you. Dr. Corgan Parai, thanks. So much for that overview. If I could capture as you were presenting, I was thinking through, and, and perhaps one way to think about this is that the accelerated approval pathway um, presents us with a structure to have deliberate uncertainty. Is that a, a way to think about it, that we, we know we, we've got uncertainty, but we want to do something, but let's be deliberate about that uncertainty. Is, is that we one way to think about it. I think that is one way of thinking about it. We have some uncertainty. It has to be. Um, we have some uncertainty with regular approvals. We know that when we go out, we may find safety signals, but we have a little bit more uncertainty here in the relationship between that surrogate and the clinical benefit. And we are taking the deliberate step of going the next step with a new trial to, to reduce or eliminate that uncertainty. Great, thank you so much for that um, overview. And so let's talk about um, moving past that or how we, how we learn more or resolve that uncertainty. And that is through the um, confirmatory trials. And so I have here that we're going to hear now from Dr. Kevin Fain, who's a senior policy advisor in um, FDA's Office of New Drug Policy in CEDAR. So Dr. Fain, would you help us a bit with this, um, with resolving, we have our deliberate uncertainty, then we wanna do some work to uh, help us get to uh, more certainty. Would you pick up the microphone and tell us about confirmatory trials? Thank you, absolutely, happy to do that. And I've just put on the screen an outline to help you all see where we're headed in this presentation. And I wanna echo what Dr. Corgan Fry said, we really appreciate everyone's interest in this topic. It's very important as well as our other panelists, particularly the patient panelists. But I do want to dig a little bit more into that confirmatory trial step. And you see here an outline, I'm just gonna to touch on very briefly the regulatory framework, which Dr. Corgan Fry nicely walked through, but I'll highlight the points that are relevant for the confirmatory trial phase. And then the second part of the presentation, we'll be thinking about the plan of the confirmatory trial and especially the progress of that trial uh, from the point of the approval of the drug through the, the various timeframes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the reporting of the status of the confirmatory trials to FDA and then reasons for delays, because those are, are very important to understand. And the third and final part, we'll be looking at regulatory options, thinking about those results of the confirmatory trials. What are options that FDA has in certain circumstances for involuntary withdrawal or voluntary withdrawal? And we'll talk more uh, about that. So the regulatory framework, I'll just cover this very briefly. So just please keep in mind that our overarching approval requirements uh, for drugs in section 505 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, those still apply for accelerated approvals. And so it's important to understand that substantial evidence based on adequate and well-controlled clinical investigations 
now, of the drug's effect, that's necessary for approval, as well as the benefits of the drug outweighing the risks. This is an important part of the calculus. But as Dr. Corgan Cry explained, for accelerated approval, the effect can be shown on the surrogate endpoint or an intermediate endpoint, you know, reasonably likely, but not known per se to predict benefit in those outcomes that we care about, how patients feel, function, or survive. And our regulation itself actually notes that there's some uncertainty as to that relationship between the surrogate endpoint and the clinical benefit. So the confirmatory trials are designed to address this uncertainty. And we can require these trials under the statutory framework uh, that was mentioned earlier in our regulations. Our regulations interestingly note that such trials would usually be studies already underway, but that's not always the case. There are exceptions to that. And the fact that the trials must be adequate and well-controlled. And by assessing the drug's clinical benefit, really the goal, as uh, Dr. Winkler said, is the goal of the confirmatory trial is to address that remaining uncertainty you know, between the surrogate endpoint and the clinical benefit. And there is an expectation that some of these clinical trials, you know, adequately designed and conducted, will not confirm clinical benefit for the drug. So that's important to keep in mind. And the completion of the confirmatory trials and the submission of those results, it's critical for FDA to understand ultimately that association and the benefit of the drug. So let's talk a little bit about that in the second part for confirmatory trials. So taking a step back and thinking about the point of approval of that drug under the accelerated approval pathway. So that confirmatory trial is established in that approval and specific milestones are laid out. So I've listed some here in the sub bullet about initiating the trial, enrollment targets, completion, and even that final report submission to FDA. And I've just given a snapshot here uh, of a sample excerpt from an approval letter. This is all publicly available uh, on drugs at FDA. So you and the public can, can search for examples that you care about, but you'll see in this language, the emphasis on due diligence of the conduct of the trial, as well as the fact that if there's failure to verify clinical benefit, we do have this option for withdrawal, what I'll call involuntary withdrawal, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So just digging a little bit deeper uh, in the approval uh, phase, uh, this is the same approval letter, but it just shows more details about that confirmatory trial. And this is all, again, publicly available information but you see a description of the confirmatory trial, the enrollment criteria, uh, as well as the endpoint, the primary endpoint, what's trying to get at that clinical benefit. And then you see a timeline in place here for the interim report submission and the completion of the trial and that final report submission. So that's all laid out in the approval letter. And that uh, is tracked, like the, the, the uh, progress of the trial is tracked through the annual report. So the regulations for accelerated approval require sponsors to every year in the annual report provide information about the status of the confirmatory trial. And I've just given you some examples here at the bottom of the slide of that information, the accrual rate, you know, the number of subjects enrolled up to the time of reporting, the status of the study. I'll talk a little bit more about these statuses on the next slide, but the completion date, uh, the final study report submission date, if that's applicable, uh, and a revised schedule, uh, if the schedule has changed. So all of this is being reported on an annual basis to FDA for all of these confirmatory trials for tracking purposes. And in terms of the status categories, you see them here, it's pretty straightforward. It's defined in the regulation. Uh, the only nuance is the pending status, that means the study has not been initiated yet, so enrollment has not been done, but that's still on the timeline for the milestone, so it's not considered delayed. Ongoing status means what it says, the trial is meeting those milestones, and that might even be ahead of schedule. Delayed, we'll talk about that some more in a moment, and terminated is if the study was ended before completion and the final study report has not yet been submitted to FDA. The final category of submitted is the study has been completed or terminated and that report has been submitted to FDA. So what does this mean? So I wanted you to understand in terms of tracking, 
information is available. Of course, FDA has all of this internally, but information is available publicly uh, for you all and the public to see these, the status of these trials. And so I've just shown you the web page, uh, which is a search engine where you can select accelerated approval for these post-marketing requirements and commitments. There are other options as well, if you're interested. And when you do this and you use this mechanism, you can see more details uh, about these uh, confirmatory trials. And I'm sorry, I advanced a little too soon. And what I wanted to do in terms of details is delay. So for some of these trials, the status will be delayed and it's important to understand possible reasons for this. And I've listed some here uh, in terms of trial completion, but I'm gonna go back. Um, I apologize. So I'm gonna focus on trial completion and final report submission. So these are very important to understand. So you see an example in the first bullet if that completion milestone was missed because there have been fewer progression-free survival events, for example, something that may not have been expected in terms of the planning of that confirmatory trial, and it turned out to be the case as the trial was progressing, that there were just an inadequate number of events to meet that completion milestone. Some other examples here, the middle bullet, uh, if the patients haven't reached the response yet, sufficient number of patients, uh, in order to make that a meaningful uh, comparison and, and analysis. And the final bullet is the same type of theme where overall survival has not yet been reached. So these are examples of reasons that were not expected, not anticipated, that were causes of the delay. And here are some reasons also for protocol and enrollment. So just thinking about that earlier phase. So the protocol example, it might be that the initiation of that trial is dependent on results from another study, and those results have not been transmitted and analyzed yet. It could be that the company is incorporating feedback from FDA, that's another example. And again, all of these are on that search engine in terms of the status of these trials. Enrollment, there could be difficulties or challenges not anticipated that will be reported uh, to FDA. And in some cases, the trial could be behind schedule, but it is underway. And in this case, all of the patients have been enrolled. Okay, so what about regulatory options? So I've walked you through status of confirmatory trials and uh, reasons for delay, which is a very important category. What are options for FDA when those results uh, are concluded and submitted to FDA, uh, especially when we're thinking about results that fail to confirm clinical benefit. So I apologize, these slides are, are out of order. Um, this slide is talking about uh, the informal hearing, uh, which is a very important point, um, but I'm gonna uh, go back, so just bear with me and see this slide, thank you. So this is a, a very important point I want you all to understand. So if a confirmatory trial fails to verify clinical benefit, it's important to consider the reasons for this. And it could be that there are reasons unrelated to the drug's true effect. And I've listed some of these here, and FDA has faced this in, in real examples where perhaps the selection of the primary endpoint, something about the trial design, uh, inability to select the patients most likely to have a response, or it could be certain statistical issues. I've given some examples here like power calculation. Those could be driving the results that we see in those confirmatory trials, but it's not being driven by the drug's true effect. And so it's important to understand if there are clear reasons why the trial may not have achieved that primary endpoint, and there's no evidence that that surrogate marker is not reasonably likely to predict clinical benefits. So our understanding of that association has not changed, and there's still that unmet medical need for patients with that disease. FDA may work with the sponsor to identify a possible additional trial, an additional confirmatory trial that we think could be adequately designed to address those issues that could then go forward and truly measure the effect of the drug. So that's just something I, I want you to understand. I think it's a very important point. Okay. 
I apologize again, I'm having some computer issues. I'm gonna advance this. Okay, so the first option I want to talk about uh, is the informal hearing option. So if there are results that fail to confirm clinical benefit and we cannot see legitimate reasons outside of the drug's true effect, one of the options to uh, pursue is this uh, withdrawal through an informal hearing. Now it's important to understand there are procedures in place for this and they're sp spelled out in the regulation. I've listed that here. And part 15 of the regulation gives the structure for a lot of the steps that are involved for the informal hearing. And it's adjudicatory in nature. That's important to understand. There's a presiding officer, but there's also an advisory committee that's convened to give assistance and consult for that hearing officer on those scientific issues. Some of the features uh, I've listed here that are really important are the starting point. So the relevant center could be CEDAR or CEBER. They issue a notice of opportunity for a hearing. We call this an NOH to get the process started. It's the proposed withdrawal. The sponsor at that point must specifically request the hearing and they must submit all of the information in support of that request. So the scientific information that they think supports clinical benefit, for example, or keeping the drug on the market. And at that point, there are many steps that FDA goes through for that hearing. And I've mentioned some of them here, things like document production, required submissions, advisory committee planning, and there's other types of procedural issues. So it's, it's adjudicatory in nature. Uh, and so that involves many steps. Uh, another option is the voluntary withdrawal. Uh, so this would be based on the confirmatory trial res results again, but it could be a situation where the trial has not completed. So it could be both of those, uh, of those situations. And if FDA determines that there are grounds for withdrawal, the agency may ask the applicant to request withdrawal of approval under this regulation that I've shown you here. And some people aren't aware of this option. It's in 314.150D. And we do have sponsors in some cases uh, voluntarily withdrawing approval. And there's a process for that. And it goes through this federal register notice. So I've just given you an example here. This was an example where the company failed to complete the confirmatory trial for various you know, feasibility reasons. All of this is publicly available. And you can see other examples of these voluntary withdrawals, uh, but we've just given you one here. Um, so it's an important mechanism to understand, but it depends on the agreement of the sponsor to do that. Another aspect I wanted to point out for you is that there is publicly available information about these steps. So for the Avastin uh, withdrawal, and that's on the left-hand side, this was a breast cancer indication that there was a proposed withdrawal uh, by, by CEDAR and went through this hearing process that I just described. And because of the numerous steps involved, from the time this confirmatory trial results were submitted, it took about two years to the time the FDA commissioner issued the order of withdrawal. All of those steps are publicly available in what we call the public docket. So it's on regulations.gov. And you can see uh, all of the submissions from the center, the submissions uh, from the company, the sponsor, and then the public has opportunity to weigh in as well and submit their views, scientific and patient views. So it's a very uh, important resource to understand for that involuntary withdrawal approach. The other point I wanted to make is on the right-hand side, these proposals to withdraw uh, a drug, the involuntary withdrawal procedure. Uh, in this case, we, we can have publication. So McKenna, there's a proposal from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research to, to withdraw that drug. And there's a perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine from uh, CEDAR staffers walking through the scientific reasoning for that proposal. So I just want you to understand there are options for seeing uh, these procedures. A little bit more information 
Sorry, the slides got out of order. This is just an example of the voluntary withdrawal. So that Federal Register notice I mentioned, it specifically walks through uh, the reasons for the withdrawal. And in this case, it was because the study could not be completed. And you see here, I've, we've just highlighted the important points about the correspondence that went in with the request. And ultimately at the bottom, the approval was withdrawn. So that's legally effective. So the final slide, I just want to, to wrap up so you can see these options to try to put together what I just walked you through, uh, thinking about confirmatory trial results and thinking about the regulatory pathways. So on the left side, the left box, where we have the confirmatory trial results, in some cases, many cases you see on the far left, they verify and describe clinical benefit. And so no further action is needed at that point in terms of the confirmatory trial. But there are situations you see on the right side of failing to verify and describe clinical benefit. And the decision point is to think about if another study might be valid uh, in that situation. And I explained to you some of the reasons why that might be the case. If there are reasons unrelated to the drug's true effect for why that study failed to confirm clinical benefit. But if not, you see on the right side, the withdrawal option. And I mentioned the voluntary pathway and the involuntary pathway. But I also want you to understand on the right side, what if the confirmatory trial fails to be completed? So we talked a little bit about this, but a decision point there, you see in the middle box, you have to consider the alternative study design may allow needed evidence generation. If there were legitimate reasons, scientific reasons, why that study cannot be completed, in that case, another study might be appropriate. But if not, withdrawal is also an option in that situation. And it could be voluntary if the company agrees or involuntary. So I really appreciate your time. I hope that was helpful. Uh, just appreciate your attention to it. Thank you. Kevin, that was excellent. And I want, I want to kind of um, take our story arc here, right? So. Uh, Jacqueline helped us with the structure and that, you know, this is an area where we have deliberate uncertainty. So we say we, we need to make some advancements here, um, but let's have, but there's uncertainty. So let's be deliberate about it. And then I heard you explain the disciplined or predefined communication. So we don't just kind of stop at the, the deliberate uncertainty and the accelerated approval, but we say, you need to communicate and continue to do this work. And so um, even though FDA, you know, monitors all approved drugs in the accelerated approval space, you've got this predefined disciplined communication and action. Is that, is that a fair interpretation? Yes, that, that's right. I think that's important with those updates that are coming in about status. So FDA can think uh, ahead, uh, especially if things are getting delayed. And so that's very important. And I know Dr. Maida is gonna talk a little bit more from the oncology perspective on that, but that's an important thing, yes. And then we've got, you know, so you've got that predefined communication, have to be continuing to do the work. And then this slide tees up very nicely, right? Like what happens with those confirmatory trials? So, so when we're working through that process of trying to resolve the uncertainty, you could, you know, have the blue, excellent, <laughs> right? right? And then right. the orange here where maybe it didn't quite work, but it might, the route might be a withdrawal or the route might be to do another study. And then similarly, if you just, you know, for, for as the reasons you teed up, the trial might not be completed, then you can say, all right, maybe we need to revisit that. And again, continue this, um, you know, collaborative exploration to get us through that valley of uncertainty. Exactly. I yeah. like that summary. And it's important to stress, and I didn't stress this, about each approval has unique issues, scientific, clinical. So it's very important to put yourself in the shoes and these decision points of people in FDA trying to understand the reasons for a drug failing to confirm clinical benefit and what, what could be done and what are the options. Yeah. 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 Great. Kevin, thank you so much 
for that presentation. And as you teed up quite well, we're now going to talk about the oncology experience. If folks remember in Dr. Corrigan Corrigan's uh, overview, there was a lot of experience here in oncology. And so I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Gata Mehta to the, the stage. And Dr. Mehta, your, your day job is clinical reviewer and medical officer within the Office of New Drugs at Cedar. Would you pick up the microphone and tell us more about the oncology experience with accelerated approval? Thank you, Susan. Um, I, I'm really excited today to uh, discuss how accelerated approval program has been applied in oncology over the past three decades. Um, and this experience with accelerated approval specifically in oncology is critical to understanding this regulatory pathway as a majority of these expedited approvals have been granted for cancer indications. And uh, I have no disclosures uh, and will not discuss any off-label use of products. Let's see, just trying to advance the slides. You do lower left-hand corner in the arrow. Perfect, thank you. So today I'll review how the Accelerator Approval Program has been applied to oncology indications. I'll go over some of the endpoints that are used to support approval in this pathway, as well as what happens after Accelerator Approval is granted. And then finally, I'll introduce an Oncology Center of Excellence project uh, we launched in the fall on accelerated approval called Project Confirm, whose goal is to increase public awareness and the transparency of the accelerated approval program for oncology indications. So uh, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the US. And not surprisingly then, given the enormity of this problem, the vast majority of accelerated approvals to date have been granted in oncology, including over 85% of the approvals in the past 10 years. This has been made possible in part by the availability of endpoints in oncology that are able to support the requirements of this program, which we'll discuss later in the talk. By providing a path to expedited approval, this program balances the benefits of providing patients with cancer early access to potentially life-saving products with that calculated level of uncertainty um, that other, other speakers had uh, described before. And again, as described in the other talks, uh, this generally includes initial trials demonstrating safety and efficacy of the product for a specific indication, which leads to the accelerated approval that are then followed by post-approval confirmatory trials to verify a benefit suggested by those initial trials. And then once this is accomplished, traditional approval is granted. So accelerated approval is uh, really an important regulatory pathway in oncology and has been utilized frequently. Um, in fact, over the past two years, over one third of all oncology approvals were accelerated approvals. In oncology, as the other speakers alluded to, uh, many of the studies to support accelerated approval have relied on a response, on response rate as a primary clinical trial endpoint. And this is a measure of how much tumors shrink with the treatment given. This endpoint allows for the use of single arm trials with fewer patients and the ability to measure effects earlier than with more direct measures of clinical benefit, such as overall survival. Less frequently, and in specific cases, other endpoints such as progression-free survival and disease or recurrence-free survival have been used to support accelerated approval as well. It's, it's really important to understand the context of this that traditional approval in oncology may also rely on response rate endpoints, uh, particularly with rare cancers, uh, cancers with long survivorship, cases where the response uh, or the tumor shrinkage itself um, is the clinical benefit, uh, such as was seen with this Motigib for basal cell, carcin uh, basal cell carcinoma, and cases where randomized studies lack equipoise because of an inferior existing control arm. Like accelerated approvals, these traditional approvals have sometimes also been based on progression-free, uh, disease-free or recurrence-free survival. But an important distinction here is that many traditional approvals in oncology are also or have been based on overall survival uh, as a direct measure of clinical benefit.
So leveraging uh, these accelerated approval regulations, um, this expedited appro uh, approval pathway has been applied to 167 oncology indications over the past three decades. And during this time, the cancer landscape has expanded significantly, um, as uh, Dr. Corrigan Karaya described, including breakthroughs in immunotherapy and precision oncology. And this has led to really exponential increase in the application of accelerated approval to oncology indications with only 18 approvals uh, or 18 accelerated approvals in the first decade and 112 accelerated approvals in the last decade. The impact of this really cannot be overstated as these accelerated approvals have included transformative drugs like Levec that ushered in the era of targeted therapy, drugs like daratumumab and Belcade that changed the field of multiple myeloma and targeted therapies such as electinib and osimertinib that have revolutionized lung cancer treatment. And these uh, impactful drugs were approved years earlier than they would have been otherwise. Um, if we use time to verification of benefit based on those confirmatory trials as a measure of when these drugs would have been approved through a traditional pathway. Uh, for example, this included the approval of Gleevec for gastric cancer nearly seven years before traditional approval was eventually granted. Uh, the approval of the immunotherapy drug nivolumab for melanoma over four years before traditional approval was granted. And the targeted therapy crizotinib for ALK positive lung cancers over two years before traditional approval was granted. And uh, this is really important because as not all patients are able to enroll on a clinical trial, these accelerated approvals are critical to promoting equitable acts, early access to these potentially life-saving drugs. As uh, Dr. Fain reviewed in uh, detail, after an accelerated approval is granted, it must be followed up by post-approval studies to verify that clinical benefit that was predicted by the initial study. And I'll, I'll review this in brief in the context of oncology. In oncology, this verification of benefit has often been achieved through randomized trials with survival endpoints or with alternative design, uh, designs depending on the situation, such as additional response rate or duration of response data. Because it may be difficult to enroll patients in a randomized trial for the exact same indication that the accelerated approval is granted in, oftentimes accelerated approval is initially granted in a later line or a refractory line of therapy and confirmatory trials to verify benefit and enroll patients in earlier lines of therapy. This avoids overlap and has the added potential benefit of expanding the indication after the confirmatory trial has been completed. Once benefit is verified, a traditional approval is uh, granted. And in oncology, this process has taken a median of 3.1 years. To encourage this timely completion of uh, confirmatory trials, um, and building on what Dr. Fain described, the Oncology Center of Excellence has a comprehensive program that monitors confirmatory trial progress at various time points. We've also conducted multiple advisory committee meetings on products for accelerated approval to further examine confirmatory data and, and or the status of uh, these trials. And then finally, our program includes efforts for tracking and outreach with oncology drug development stakeholders, including patients as well as educational outreach on accelerated approval, which I'll describe a little later on. Because accelerated approval balances some degree of uncertainty, um, which we talked about earlier, it is expected that this process will not always lead to verification of benefit. In fact, if 100% of accelerated approvals were successful, then the program would not serve a purpose and regular approval should have been granted in the first place. In some cases, because of a variety of factors such as enrollment challenges, confirmatory trials may not be started or completed in a timely fashion. In other cases, these confirmatory trials may simply not demonstrate a clinical benefit. And in these cases, the indication may be withdrawn either voluntarily by the sponsor or by FDA after a public hearing. And this latter scenario is time and resource intensive and has taken over two years to complete as Dr. Fain described in the case of Avastin for metastatic breast cancer. So, uh, so now putting this all together, we can look at the current status of accelerated approvals in oncology. Of the 167 accelerated approvals that have been granted 
to date, 67 of these still have ongoing confirmatory trials or pending verification of benefit. 100 oncology accelerated approvals are no longer ongoing and have, have a final disposition. Of these, confirmatory trials have been completed and verified clinical benefit for 83, and traditional approval has been since granted for these indications. Again, in oncology, this has occurred a median of 3.1 years after the accelerated approval was granted. And then finally, in 17 cases, either the confirmatory trials were not completed with due diligence or did not verify benefit, and these indications were withdrawn. This last process to withdraw an indication is not automatic, and the onus rests on FDA to initiate this withdrawal program. The term dangling accelerated approval was coined to describe indications for which confirmatory trials have been completed and failed to verify clinical benefit, but which have yet to been withdrawn. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this now. Um, uh, this term has been uh, recently applied to a number of immunotherapy indications for immune checkpoint inhibitors in oncology. And this was a subject of a three-day advisory committee meeting in April of 2021. I'll note, however, that this category of dangling approvals, uh, accelerated approvals, is not limited to immune checkpoint inhibitors, and other products have fallen into this category recently. We plan to take a similar approach in such cases, including regular public hearings to discuss the status of confirmatory trials. The immunotherapy indications that were classified as dangling were part of a class of drugs that targeted the immune checkpoint uh, PD-1 and its ligand or target PD-L1. It's important to recognize first that these drugs have been transformative in oncology and have led to 91 approvals overall. Among these, there have been 38 accelerated approvals. 10 of those accelerated approvals, which covered the four drugs listed here, were considered dangling with failed confirmatory trials. In many of these cases, relatively low response rates that were initially used to support accelerated approval did not translate to a survival advantage. Let's see. I think these slides might be a little out of order. That's, that's right. Um, so four of these indications were removed by the company voluntarily without further FDA action. And then the advisory committee meeting I mentioned earlier was held over three days to discuss the remaining indications. After this, three additional indications, which are highlighted here, were removed. After the advisory committee meeting, one indication, pembrolizumab for patients with cisplatin ineligible urothelial cancer was modified to include a narrower population of patients ineligible for platinum chemotherapy as a whole. Finally, the last two indications, atezolizumab for patients with cisplatin ineligible urothelial cancer and pembrolizumab for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma that has been previously treated with serafinib remain under discussion with, an alter, with alternate confirmatory trials ongoing. And this is that um, right-sided graph that Kevin had shown earlier. Overall, this experience has been critical to understanding how accelerated approval should be applied in this novel class of drugs, where initial response rates did not consistently predict long-term outcomes. So in summary, perhaps no therapeutic area has demonstrated the worth of accelerated approval program as well as oncology, with the large majority of FDA's ex expedited approvals granted for cancer indications. Cancer is a significant problem worldwide and the second leading cause of death in the US. The use of accelerated approval in oncology over the past three decades has been a driving force in maximizing early access to transformative and potentially life-saving therapies for patients living with this disease. This has been supported by endpoints such as response rate that are unique to oncology and have facilitated our implementation of this program. 
Finally, while a majority of confirmatory trials after accelerated approval eventually verify clinical benefit and lead to traditional approval, a proportion will fail to ben verify benefit and lead to withdrawal of the indication. It's important to emphasize that this is an expected outcome of the program. And as the cancer treatment landscape is constantly evolving in cases such as what we experienced with the dangling approvals in immunotherapy provide an opportunity to better understand how accelerated approval should be best utilized uh, in these emerging therapeutic areas. This will help us provide, continue to provide early access uh, to important drugs while minimizing risk. And then finally, before I finish, I just wanted to introduce the Oncology Center of Excellence uh, initiative called Project Confirm. This project was launched publicly in October 2021 to increase transparency around accelerated approvals for oncology indications. The centerpiece of this effort is a curated database of oncology accelerated approvals, which is public, searchable, and updated in real time. We also provide general education on accelerated approval program, its outcomes, including answers to some frequently uh, asked questions, and a description of the processes uh, for verification of benefit and withdrawal that we talked about today. And this website is available on the Oncology Center of Excellence homepage, and you can contact us about the project at the email listed here. We hope that this will complement programs and meetings such as this one today by providing important and reliable information to relevant stakeholders. And I'd just like to thank the following individuals for their help with this talk. And thank you again to the Reagan Udall Foundation for the opportunity to speak about this important topic. Dr. Mehta, thank you. I, I want to take us, so, so if I think about how you've taken us on the arc, we talked about the structure and the, the deliberate uncertainty, then talked through the disciplined and predetermined communications to work through that, that all of which are part of that accelerated approval process. And then you've helped us see that practical application. Um, so a couple questions based on that. It, it looks like, as we might expect, when you're dealing with uncertainty and then kind of doing the work to work through that uncertainty, sometimes you get the answer you expected and sometimes you don't get the answer you expected. But FDA works with both of those situations and, and, and navigates forward. But is it fair that in both of those situations, the agency is learning industry is learning and, and we're kind of advancing the field overall. Is, is that a way to think about what's happening as we have that disciplined communication and the confirmatory trials and continuing to, to do the work to, net, to uh, resolve the uncertainty? That's absolutely right, Susan. And I think the dangling uh, immunotherapy indications were really a learning point uh, kind of for accelerated approval overall and, and uh, both for FDA and, and industry. And this was a new field, so uh, there was there's so much to learn, uh, not only from a scientific standpoint, but also from a, a, a regulatory standpoint. And so, so it's been it's been a great opportunity to provide access to these important drugs early, but at the same point to learn from, uh, you know, how how these regulatory tools can be applied to to providing that access. So we. In order to use accelerated approval, we have to know enough to kind of put the box around the uncertainty. Is that a, a way to well, think about I, it? I think or? we we do have to we do have to learn from our experience and yeah. uh, to continue to use it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta, and and all of our, all three of our speakers from FDA for taking us through that um, deep understand you know deep education on what it takes what the accelerated approval authority is how that's structured and what it is that we um, are, are working with when we talk about the accelerated approval pathway and then also uh, the experience to see how it's been working in the oncology center of excellence um, that means it's time to move to our second panel and this is a panel we're going to move from the technical overall structure to the why. Um, so we talked about the what, 
And now we're going to talk about the why and why are there situations where we would want to have that deliberate, you know, we've, we've gotten to a place where we have the deliberate uncertainty and we would want to follow this type of path. And so we are going to hear from uh, patients. Four individuals have graciously agreed to join us and talk about their experience with products made available via the accelerated approval process. Each of them has direct experience and from a different vantage point. And, and this is one place where I'll say it, it's really um, a benefit of these virtual meetings that we have the opportunity to connect with folks who are all over the country and hear their voices um, without putting kind of the, the, the requirement for travel and, and all that that involves. And so I'm particularly uh, pleased to move to this next section where um, we are going to turn to these patients to hear directly about their experience. Uh, so we're going to open, um, and I am going to, rather than put my voice over any of our individual patients, I'm going to ask our patients to um, introduce themselves as they step up to, to tell their story. And we're going to start with Alberto Rubio. Um, Mr. Rubio, you are joining us from Texas and want to share your experience in thinking through kind of the, the patient with HIV. So um, I see you on screen and unmuted, Alberto. Good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for that gracious introduction. I'd like to thank the FDA and the Reagan Unal Foundation. Um, no doubt there are pharmaceutical reps and other researchers in the audience. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for the dedication and the devotion that you have meant, not just for HIV, but for so many other diseases. Your sacrifices have not gone unnoticed. Thank you for that. Um, I'm the, I was a respiratory therapist and in, 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 in the early 1980s in Dallas, Texas, at, at, at Baylor Medical Center, the, probably the ninth largest hospital in the nation at the time, I was the ICU supervisor and I showed up at the second shift to get reports from the first shift supervisor. And he said, Alberto, I've got the damnedest case. He said, this guy came in this morning. I gave him a breathing treatment between 9 and 10 in the morning. And he's now in the intensive care unit on a ventilator, uh, on, on dialysis. He was on night, um, vasopressors. He was on pretty much every machine that we could have in an intensive care room. And he was 29. He looked like a strapping model. He was a New Yorker who came in to, to, to visit a friend for the weekend, and he was going to die. We had no idea what was going on. We had, no one knew whether it was a, a, a virus. Uh, uh, was he contaminated with some chemical? Uh, what, was it a bacterium unidentified? No one knew anything. And so we put him in isolation under the strictest isolation. And we made some very hard choices about how to treat a deadly unknown. And that uncertainty is what we referenced today, haven't we? It has, it's the, the unknown and how do we corral it? How do we make the uncertainty smaller? How can we diminish it so that we know that we are advancing? And that took sacrifice. And my people, the gay and lesbian community of Dallas, Texas, actually of the nation, would not go gentle into that good night. We were told in, in the 1980s that there was nothing that could be done for us, and we refused to believe it. There were only a certain number of centers in the nation, a few of them, I think three or four, I can't really remember now, I'm old. But we were asking, we, we were told we would have to fly to these centers. If we, were, if we were gonna be patients involved in clinical studies, we would have to be taken to these centers. We had T-cell counts in the, in the 200s, we couldn't go out in crowds. We'd die from getting a disease just from somebody sitting next to us coughing on the plane. Worse than that, you, you guys were trying to develop studies with maybe 20 or 30 people and your studies were six to nine months long and half of your study patients would die halfway through it. Limited access to patients, limited access to drugs. And we had all these wonderful centers Southwest Medical School in Parkland in Dallas. We had San Francisco, Chicago. There was absolutely no reason to follow the old protocol. But the old protocol did not yield easily. 
We had to die. We had die-ins. We had to sit on the side, uh, lay on the sidewalks and had chalk lines drawn around us. We had the panels, the, the, the AIDS panels where people who had died would make one and add it to, to the blankets that were spread out in Washington, D.C. But I understand that in the 1980s was a different mindset. HIV was considered by pastors to be a condemnation of a lifestyle. Politicians did not go anywhere near us because there was nothing politically to be gained. I understand that it's harsh, but I was there. And, and look who the population was that was being affected. Gay men, sex workers, IV drug abusers, or the marginalized minorities. Who was going to stand up for us? So we decided to stand up for ourselves. And we made the unspeakable declaration that patients should be involved in the development of clinical research. We insisted upon a, a seat at the table. And when the clinicians rightfully said, the researchers this afternoon have told us how difficult it is to design uh, a, a trial. So many things could go wrong with it. And if we were going to multiply these research centers, well, we need biostatisticians, we'd need nurses, we'd need trained researchers, and we would need the space in the hospitals to house them. That meant money. So we had to pressure the legislators who kept telling us, no, but we'll have to take money away from cancer research if we're going to do it in HIV. And our response was, why does the pie have to stay the same size? Make a bigger pie. Get more money out there. And all the time, my brothers and sisters, I watched my friends die. I watched my friends take that same position as that first man that I treated back in the early 80s. And in that patient's bed, I saw myself. I saw myself. But thanks to the research that came about, thanks to people who devoted themselves to tweaking AZT, thanks to the incredible biologist who figured out how HIV infected the cell and showed us the different stages that could individually be targeted with different drugs, we got protease inhibitors. And truly, I saw Lazarus moments. I saw the Lazarus effect. And so today, I want to thank everyone who has participated and has made it possible for me to be 68 years old, something that I was told back in 1987 was probably not going to happen. I'm Alberto. I'm a person living with AIDS. Thank you for listening. Alberto, thank you for sharing. And, and you illuminated a couple of things for us so let's let's talk about those right you you underscored that um participating in clinical trials is something that particularly then but still exists today is not necessarily available to all patients that's right, that, 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 that's right. it is population centric it's got to be a metropolitan area you have to have an ability for the patient to get to the center, which means uh, some kind of a, a driving service, uh, and, and then someone to pick them up, someone to care for the patient living with AIDS if, 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 it's, if he's, he or she's debilitated. Yes, there are lots of, of different steps to getting that patient into the center. And so when we talked about, you know, you heard the, the discussions about the you know, that we try to go here with deliberate un uncertainty. Right. Part of that accelerated approval is to then make the product more available while we work through that. So yes. how do you think about the, you know, the impact of knowing that you're using something where there's, you know, it's, it's, there's uncertainty with all drugs, but here mm -hmm. we know, mm -hmm. <laughs> we know mm -hmm. that it's uncertain, but then you've got the broader access. Give us a bit of the patient perspective and particularly in the HIV community, how you thought about that um, using, being able to use something, recognizing that it, it, you, you were still learning a lot about it. Certainly. Certainly, and, and from our perspective, in a closed gay and lesbian community, we all knew one another. I can remember being in a room of, of 50 
political activists. See, it was 1969 with Stonewall. So 1980, 10 years later, we have all these brilliant leaders uh, leading the fight for gay and lesbian civil rights. And then in the 80s, they were dead. So we had a choice. Either we participate in these clinical studies and try together to live long enough to find a drug that will do it or to die with a, a, a death that had meaning. At least I tried. I participated in any number of drug studies at Parkland. I injected medications into my stomach. I arrived in the middle of, the, of my bed at two in the morning, but I had to do it because as I said at the beginning, I was not gonna go gentle into that good night. I was not going to go without a fight. That wasn't going to happen. I said goodbye to friends who did give up, who did give up, they couldn't take the side of this. But there were many of us who said, for the better, betterment of all, we need to participate. And that's what we did. Yeah. Which then reminds us, you know, part of when we heard about the, the structure and the, 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 the technicalities of the law, right? A critical, mm -hmm. unmet, yeah. un, you know, unmet need yeah. in a serious and life threatening illness, mm -hmm. which you, you have here. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, I, I'll note also, you spoke to the activism of, of we also need to know enough, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, when you think about that deliberate uncertainty, you do still know enough to be uncertain, which is more than, than, than not knowing enough. So you, you write that the, we had to have the research to yield the, the product that you know, could, could get to the point Absolutely. where they could be used in an accelerated approval process. So you're pointing out there's, there's active, you know, you know, there's work that has to be done before that and then making it um, yes. available in this space. We had to educate the public. There were some among my community who distrusted the medical community. Why would they want to help us? Yeah. You know, there was talk of the pharmaceutical companies throwing anything out there to make a buck. This was not the case, but that's what some people thought. We had to educate our community. In fact, at the very beginning, we had to educate the entire population of the country. First, there was the misunderstanding that it was a gay disease, a gay white man's disease. And then it was a couple of years later in 83 or 84, uh, the, the sex workers in San Francisco, women were identified. So slowly the spectrum of potential uh, infected patients went from people like me to everybody in the world. And that uh, was the help uh, to prepare the audience for a better understanding. We're all in this together. That took time. Absolutely. Well, Alberto, I'm gonna I, thank you for what you've done and for sharing your story today. You know, I'm gonna come back to you at the end of this segment, so don't go away, but you can step away for now and we'll turn to, to our next patient. But Alberto, thank you. That's right, thank you. Uh, so we, we said we have, we're going to hear from four patients. And so the second patient from whom we are going to hear is Dr. Navdeep Singh. Dr. Singh, um, would you, you are joining us from Michigan. I see you on camera. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Why don't you tell us, you know, we heard Alberto has the, the powerful early advocate, you know, now decades of experience with products under accelerated approval. Um, let's hear from you. You have a very different experience. Please, please tell us your story, Dr. Singh. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, uh, that was very powerful, Albert. I just wanted to, um, that was very, very powerful. Um, and I, um, you know, I was very interested to hear that because my experience was actually very different. Um, I um, was born with beta thalassemia. Um, I was diagnosed at about nine months old. So when I was born, my parents, uh, you know, they're always a very happy bouncing, you know, eight pounds, 10 ounces boy. He's, uh, um, you know, doing really well. But about nine months, as you know, with uh, beta thalassemia, you start to go off um, the fetal hemoglobin and you start to produce your own. So they started noticing, you know, he's getting really sick. He doesn't look good. Um, they took me in and ran a slew of tests and they found out that I was, you know, I had beta thalassemia. Um, so my treatment plan ever since I was a child was to get chronic blood transfusions. So I have been receiving 
blood transfusions for as long as I can remember. I believe my dad even says that, you know, I used to, when you were a baby, you had your first transfusion and, you know, I would move the IV pole and hold you because you would cry, uh, you know, as, when I was a young child. So, um, so blood transfusions though have been just my, my kind of, it's my booster shot. I just find it as a way of keeping me going and um, just making sure that I am you know, suppressing the bone marrow and keeping my hemoglobin at an adequate level. And um, for a long time, I don't remember um, getting any kind of treatment. And then when, um, when, as I was getting older, then there was a new thing that came out called Desferol. And so Desferol was a way of um, helping with the iron chelation. So as you know, with the blood transfusions, you start to get all that iron overload. So you start to you know, damage the liver, it can go into your heart and you start getting just um, iron overload, your face can start to look, you know, a darker color and, you know, all these things. So I started getting a poke one arm for my, you know, blood transfusion, and then they would actually do it IV. So I would have, I'd lay there, you know, watching, you know, TV, I'd watch Garfield, and I'd have one arm with my blood transfusion and another arm with my dust for all. Um, it was just IV at that time. And then when I was about 10 in 1995, they said, you know, now you have to do this at home, you have to do dust for all at home. And so, you know, I was 10 years old and learned how to, you know, poke myself at home. And so I would, um, I wouldn't, I would do Desperol and it would last eight hours a night. It, uh, it was, it was like a syringe driver, just slowly push the medicine in for, um, for eight hours. So I would just do it before going to sleep. You know, and I remember my mom and dad even kind of having a little teary eye, you know, they're both PhDs in electrical engineering and, you know, they're not into medical thing and they're learning how to poke but you know for your children you do you do everything for your children so they learned it and they would do it on me and then and then slowly slowly as I became older I started doing it myself but just my quality of life you know I didn't like going to sleepovers and taking this pump with me and um, you know this kind of thing and you know for people like what's going on and I would work as a nurse um, and then when I started getting older I started working as a nurse um, and, you know, I would work night shifts. And so I'd carry this pump around, you know, with me. Um, and then just, you know, as you got getting older, you, your body starts to get very, very tired. There's only so many sites you can rotate, you know, these, these shots. Um, and it's a big thing. I, I went off to college and I had to get the, you know, you, you make the medicine yourself. So, you know, while you're studying, you know, everybody's out, you know, studying or partying or sleep or I would go home and I'd have to make all this medicine. I remember even when I went to Dubai, um, I was stopped at the airport because they said, what is all this powder you're bringing in the suitcase? You know, and I said, no, this is my medicine. This is, this is dust fall. This is to, you know, keep me alive. And, and then, you know, I would get hassled at the airports. No, next time you need to bring a doctor's note specifically saying what this is. And I said, geez, you know, this was, it was getting quite hard. Um, and then all of a sudden this medication came out, uh, it was known as um, Jadenu, um, and it was a pill. Well, the very first thing that came out was actually X Jade, which was like sprinkles. And then after that, they said, you know, now there's actually a pill that has come out because uh, some patients that I would talk to said, you know, we couldn't tolerate the sprinkles, but now there's a pill. Uh, and it was a, it was totally life changing. It was absolutely life changing. And you know, I would just wake up in the morning and take um, take three pills, and that was it. You know, and it was like a a release, an emotional release because there was no more needles, there was no more pokes, there was no more you know, explaining myself, you know, carrying a pump all day, no more um, sub, you know, no more rotating the abdomen sites. And, and, and it was, it, it really just was a, a life-changing thing. And, you know, I could, you know, so normal ferritin levels for an adult male, you know, are, are under 200. And um, mines have been consistently around 500, 600 with this new medication, with the, with the pill. And I could never, ever get my ferritin um, that low with Desperol. It was always around, maybe 800, 900, sometimes a thousand, you know, so uh, this pill, it had a longer half-life. And so I was able to, um, you know, it was just like a win-win situation because, it, you know, I thought, oh, if I'm taking a pill, I'll be sacrificing my, my health, but it, it, it was, it was a win-win situation for me. So, so I didn't know about that. There was accelerated proof. I just one day heard that it was released. And, and so all this information that you all have presented today is very, you know, um, life-changing. I had no idea there was so much background work about this, but yeah, I'm very, very thankful that it came out. It's been totally life-changing. Um, getting kids, you know, when I used to go to thalassemia conferences and getting kids to take, you know, pokes and, and, and children died and people died because they were just non-compliant um, with this regimen. 
But now I just, I mean, there's just no excuse. You know, when I go to those conferences now, I say, you know, you kids now, you can just take a pill. You have no idea what older generations had to go through. So it's, it's, it has totally changed the game um, with, with our health. So I'm, I'm extremely thankful for everything. Navdeep, you've illustrated, you know, another component, which is, you know, here, a lifelong illness. So you've, as you said, been dealing with this every, well, it's been clinically addressed since you were nine months old, but you've physically been dealing with it every, every day of your life. And here, the opportunity in the product was about a, a substantial substantial change in the ability of you to to function more normally so i but you still do blood transfusions right yes and actually today i had my blood transfusion so i i raced out of the hospital to make sure i made it to this meeting but yes it's every friday every three to four uh, every three to four weeks and it's it just alternating just to keep my hemoglobin up but yeah it's it's un, until there's a um, something else besides a bone marrow transplant because I don't have any siblings and you know it's it's more risky so this is this is just how it is for now <laughs> but the translation transition rather from I can still see your visual both arms up right in in a in a, a with infusions simultaneously then being able to do one at home but still you know discipline of of every day to now that ability to use something from an oral perspective. Um, that's it, it. And so for you, did you have any, you said you may not even have, have kind of known about the accelerated approval, but in, in all of these, these interventions, what do you um, think about as you have the opportunity to try something new? Is there ever a, a hesitation as you think about that? Yes, because I remember when X Shade was was released. So that was, you know, you know, it's a little sprinkles, and and even with even with Jadenu, you know, I would, um, you know, some doctors said, well, there has been, um, you know, it's it's a pill, so it, you know, it, you know, you have to watch your kidneys. And I said, well, I get blood work every month anyway, so you know, I, I am if something's going to happen, we're already we're already going to take care of that. Um, but yeah, anytime you try anything new, it's 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 you know, but I think. I remember starting in 1995 and I did Desperol till 2016. And, you know, so there's just so many spots you can poke in your abdomen and, and, and after, you know, your body eventually says enough. And so you say, okay, I'm going to try this. And, but I was very, 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 very um, diligent with the Desperol because my hematologist said, you only get two days off a year, your birthday and Christmas. And, so, <laughs> and for a 10 year old boy, you know, that's, that's, you know, when you hear that, you know, so it was very hard, but I was really, you know, my parents told me, if you do this, you will have a normal life. You won't have any liver problems. And so I was really, really strict about it. But, you know, when this pill came out and my, and my iron levels have dropped, my, uh, my ferritin levels have dropped and better than, and no pokes. And, you know, it just was t totally changing. It was, it, it was just night and day difference. Uh, now, now deep, you've given me another D for today, which is discipline. And, and the, <laughs> the, the discipline that you showed as I, I think about the 12 year old in my house and what you were able to do through, throughout here, it's just um, impressive. And then thank you for telling us, sharing your story and helping us understand kind of the advancements in, in unmet clinical need can be about some of that just changing your ability to navigate, having a better clinical outcome, but also dramatically changing the intensity of intervention. And one thing also about the expense, I just want to let you, because with Desperol, it was like a, it was like a $50 a week kind of a copay. And when this Jadenu came out, you know, it was a new drug and it was brand name. So they gave us this copay card. And I remember, uh, you know, it paid your whole deductible when you, when you, when you, you know, so for a patient uh, to have, when this new drug came out, it was just some little side, sideway thing, but it paid the entire deductible to, to do this. And now it's generic. So, you know, the costs are down, but, but that was another thing that was just shocking at that time when new things come out and, and, you know, it was, it was a, it paid the entire, my health insurance. And so the financial costs of the dust for all, you know, was extremely ex expensive also. So. Um, mm -hmm. And as well as it was shipping and, and making the medicine and all the syringes and all the needles. So it was to go all from that from a pill and spend life changing. Yeah.
Navdeep, thank you. And you've teed up a good conversation for our final chat where we get some of that payer perspective because they too are trying to figure out this uncertainty. But Navdeep, thank you for now. I'm going to let you step away and we'll move to our next patient. But thank you for getting home from the hospital <laughs> in time <laughs> to share your story. We uh, greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, so we'll go to our third story, um, and, and each of these is, is so powerful. So, so thank you again to each of you for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask Tiana Wolford to step up next. Tiana, I know you are joining us from California. I <laughs> see your bright face. Thank you for joining us. Would you introduce yourself and then tell us Tell us your story, because you have a different dynamic here. So I'm, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, Tiana. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Um, I'm just so overwhelmed by these powerful stories and really honored to share this space. So thank you for this opportunity. So um, yes, my name is Tiana Wolford. I am 30 years old, and I was born with sickle cell anemia. Um, and just a little bit of background, you know, I did relatively well as a child. Um, I was hospitalized maybe once or twice a year, and then things really started spiraling out of control by the time I hit puberty around age 14. And um, so by the time I was 15, I had both of my hips replaced. I was transfusion dependent and have tried all of those iron chelations that were just mentioned. Um, I had been in liver failure because I started having transfusion reactions. And uh, this was all happening in high school at a time when you're trying to kind of fit in and find your place in the world. And so it was, it was really challenging. And um, by the time I graduated high school, I was hospitalized at least twice a month. I had missed over 60% of my senior year of high school. Um, <laughs> So that was really difficult. And then, you know, I was approached with having a, about having a bone marrow transplant because my hematologist felt that I was exhausting all of my options. And um, I was on a medication called hydroxyurea, which for 29 years, that is the only FDA approved drug that the sickle cell community has had access to. And there are limitations to that medication. I mean, it is disease modifying, but it is a low dose chemotherapy. So a lot of parents are nervous to put their children on it. I mean, it can cause low sperm count, low ovarian reserve, hair thinning from the toxicity. And so, um, you know, I decided to go through with clinical research and I had a half match bone marrow transplant and I was incredibly desperate at the time and pretty much willing to give up anything except my fertility. And I knew that the chemotherapy and radiation could do that. So long story short, um, I rejected the transplant. And so now I still have sickle cell and I'm infertile. And, um, you know, but a bone marrow transplant, I mean, that is the only cure for sickle cell, but it's not universal because everybody doesn't have a match and it's incredibly risky. So a lot of people, you know, don't want to subject themselves to it. And so definitely by the time I had rejected the transplant, it was clear that I was running out of options. And this is something that was common in the sickle cell community because we've been left out of clinical research for so long. And then in 2019, um, within a two year time span, we had two FDA approved drugs through the process of accelerated approval. And um, that's been amazing, like not just for me, but for my community, because the sickle cell community is very close knit and small. So literally, I'd be having conversations with individuals with sickle cell disease through social media, never met them. And now these people that I've been engaging with on social media, I'm now meeting them at conferences and going on vacations with them because of these two new therapies, they are having a better quality of life and feel up to traveling. So I think that, you know, the biggest take home message for me is that accelerated approval offers so much promise. And I know a lot of people consider sickle cell disease to just be a disease of pain, but it's not like anywhere 
that there's blood flow, there can be complications. So we're prone to things like stroke, pulmonary embolisms, um, reproductive issues, cognitive function issues. And so, you know, any day that a drug is being delayed is a day that a patient is living but not able to thrive. And so I think that accelerated approval offers so much promise and it's been really exciting for the sickle cell community. And, you know, I know of at least 40 therapies coming down the pipeline. And I think that accelerated approval is just so promising. And we're so hopeful that we'll have access to these medications through accelerated approval. Diana, thank you. And, and you might have, have have shared, but I think you you mentioned in our earlier call that that in fact you're not benefiting from one of these today. In that, that can you tell us about your experience with with trying? Right. One well, of yes. These? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I did try both of the medications, but I had allergic reactions. So I mean, like I said, like I've done a bone marrow transplant. I've been on hydroxyurea, and actually because that has chemotherapy in it, and I've been exposed to such high dose chemotherapy and radiation for the bone marrow transplant, my bone marrow is very sensitive to toxicity. And so I'm not really able to even be on a therapeutic dose of hydroxyurea because my bone marrow freaks out every time we try to increase the dose. And so, you know, being the bone marrow transplant, hydroxyurea, the allergic reactions to the two that were approved, so, you know, personally to me, knowing that there's 40 therapies coming down the pipeline, I'm just so hopeful. And, you know, not having accelerated approval means, you know, more days that I potentially don't get to live the quality of life that I deserve. Tiana, you've given us that, you've given me another D in that idea of more days. Right, and, and that I think we'd have more days on both sides of accelerated approval, right? I, I, when, when we reach that level of, you know, the, the deliberate uncertainty and we know enough, then perhaps we can provide days on the good side. Exactly. But until we get to that, and in the absence of accelerated approval, we don't, we don't have that. Um, that that's, that's a, a powerful piece, um, Tiana, and thank you for taking the time to share your story and help us understand, and then the hope that you've seen in your community, right, in, in going from a decade-long um, treatment, but still that unmedical, unmet medical need and, and needing to pursue something else. So thank you for giving us the, the voice of um, looking for, I think, looking for us to learn from what is available under accelerated approval as well as what's approved and, and that clinical research to then hopefully get to a day where we have something that works for Tiana Wolford. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Tiana. We will come back to you um, <laughs> in just a bit. Um, with that, I'm gonna take us to our, um, our fourth patient story as we've we've moved through this continuum. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Catherine Cuvillon, uh, would you're joining us from Virginia, close to me here in the DC metro area. Catherine, would you pick up the microphone? You've, I'm sorry that I put you after three incredibly powerful stories, but I know that yours fits in there too. So would you, would you share your story and, and help us kind of get this better understanding of, of what it is, you know, this is the reality of what drove Congress to give FDA this authority, and then what it is that drives the work that's done to implement it. Yes, thank you so much for having me, for including me with these other wonderful panelists um, and their extremely moving stories, um, especially um, grateful to hear. Um, about the early involvement in the accelerated approval process um, and Alberto's st story. Uh, and then just to hear from other people who are living with conditions um, similar to what I'm living with, um, who also are waiting on 
the next drug to improve their quality of life. Um, my story starts when I was 31 years old, when I found out um, that I had breast cancer. Um, we didn't have any family history of breast cancer. Um, it really just came out of the blue. Um, the only thing I really knew about breast cancer was that October turned pink um, and that if you caught it early, um, that was a good thing. Um, so thankfully we did catch my breast cancer early. Um, it hadn't even spread to my lymph nodes. Um, so I was diagnosed as stage two, um, but I decided that I wanted to fight it really aggressively. And so we went ahead with a double mastectomy um, and I did eight rounds of chemotherapy, which I had said I did not want to do that. Um, I was really afraid of losing my hair. Um, I guess I'm vain, um, but I had never even dyed my hair before. So um, to have it all fall out, that was something I just really didn't want to do. Um, but my doctor had told me that um, my numbers would be statistically, um, it would be very advantageous for me to do the chemo. Um, looking at my survival statistics. Um, so I did agree to do that. Um, and it was six months of just really, really difficult things. Um, but I knew with breast cancer, you treated it, you fought, and then um, you became a survivor. And that's what I had on my trajectory. Um, kind of like go fight win. Um, and so we barreled through all that. Um, I also agreed after that to do five years of additional hormone blocking therapy so that it could further reduce the chances of my cancer coming back. Um, I really resonated with what Tiana was sharing about the fertility piece um, because I was 31. Um, I was dating someone. Uh, we were talking about getting married, um, but I really knew that if I didn't treat my cancer, I might not have a future at all. Um, so I was willing um, to potentially put my fertility in jeopardy uh, by doing the chemotherapy and then um, doing this additional hormone blocking um, therapy that I knew it would um, require me to postpone um, attempting to start a family. Um, I, was, I was willing to do that. Um, I also said that I would never ever do chemo again. It was so hard so awful. Um, but I just, you know, kind of kept pushing that out into the future. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to have to do that again. I'm, I'm a survivor. Um, I ended up after that, a few months later, um, I married my husband. Uh, we bought a fixer upper house. I got a promotion at work. Um, and we even uh, started talking about, um, maybe we would be able to start a family and what would that look like? Um, but then three and a half years into this hormone um, blocking treatment, I began having back pain and it just wouldn't go away. And it was kind of in a weird spot. And so eventually I reached out to my oncologist um, to say, is this something that we should check out? And so he did, um, he recommended some imaging and um, it was actually the day before my best friend's wedding that I went to do the scans. Um, and before I even got to the rehearsal, my oncologist had called and said that the pain was from a fracture in one of my vertebrae and that it looks like that fracture was caused by cancer um, eating away at my spine. Um, and that that would mean that I was a stage four cancer patient now. Um, I went online to see what does stage four mean? What's the prognosis? Um, and I saw that it was terminal and that a life expectancy was currently looking at about three years. I knew that cancer treatment was chemo. And so I thought I'm gonna have three years of chemo and then I'm gonna die. This is really a terrible outlook. Um, so I just sat in my car on the phone with the oncologist and cried and tried to summon up the words um, to tell my husband that I was gonna die. We'd only had three years together. I thought at that time, I'm not gonna live to see my 40th birthday. I had images of bald, 
skeletal people with dark circles under their eyes. And I just, I didn't want that to be me, but I knew that I would do whatever it took to have more time. Um, when we did get to meet with my oncologist, amazingly, he told me that there was another option for me besides chemo. But there was a new drug that had actually just been approved by the FDA. Uh, it was called Ibrance and it was not chemo. It was gonna be an oral drug and I would take it um, three weeks on, one week off and I could take it from home. Um, he told me about the side effects and they were nothing that seemed like something I couldn't handle. Um, anything to not have the horrible nausea. Um, and so I was really excited. I, I thought for well, finally, like there is some hope um, and such hope that this drug had actually been fast-tracked to approval. Um, the results that it had seen for the time to progression um, for patients was almost double what patients were seeing when they took this drug um, with a, the existing treatment alone. Um, I'm a numbers person and those, all those things really spoke to me and um, I decided to take Ibrance. Um, I can't even begin to explain um, how thankful and relieved I was to have an option other than chemo. Um, and not only that, but an option that might give me more time than what I thought I would have. Um, so I took the Ibrant. Um, it actually worked for me for five years. Um, in that time, um, when I reached that three-year life expectancy mark, uh, we threw a huge party um, just to celebrate that I wasn't dead yet. Um, my best friend made me give it a different name. I, I think we called it living in the bonus in bonus time. Um, but I just thought I'm not dead yet, and we have to celebrate that. Um, I also was able to celebrate my 40th birthday, um, which you never really think I'm going to be so glad to turn 40. <laughs> um, but I really was because I thought I wasn't going to live to be 40. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in 2020, in addition to COVID, um, I also got the first um, bad news from my scans that I had had um, in the five years since being on Ibrance. Um, my cancer had spread significantly and was now throughout my spine, in my ribs, in my pelvis. Um, I was experiencing a lot more pain. So I, I wasn't surprised when the scans found that my cancer had spread, um, but it was pretty devastating to realize I would no longer be able to be on this treatment that had been doing so well for me. And what did my future look like? What other treatments were there out there? Um, since that time, I've tried um, four new treatments. Um, some of them didn't really work at all. Uh, my cancer has additionally spread to my liver. Um, and the longest that any of them has worked so far has been five months. Um, so five years on Ibrance, five months on these other treatments that I've been trying. Um, and yet I've, I've lived longer than many of my friends also living with metastatic breast cancer. Um, I would like to say their names of the women um, that are my friends that have gone before, um, Jackie, Carol, Rhonda, Laura, um, so many others um, that I wasn't personally friends with, but um, all of us are just hoping that we can live long enough to see a cure or the next drug that's worthy of accelerated approval. Um, and yet still 114 of us are dying every day from metastatic breast cancer, and we just don't have time to wait. Um, so we are so appreciative of accelerated approval. We need those drugs as soon as it's safely possible to release them to us. Um, accelerated approval, I believe, gave me five years that I wouldn't have had otherwise and a wonderful quality of life during those five years. I'm so thankful and I'm just looking forward for the next drug that's gonna give me even more time. Um, Catherine, I'm pretty confident I'm not the only person who uh, had a reaction to your story. Thank you. And for kind of sharing the understanding um, of the the promise of these therapies that it may be giving you time and 
the the opportunity. And now you are are um, kind of navigating with drug developers and regulators and others trying to say where can we get to this place where we have some more un, you know some more candidate products that that could be used. So Catherine, thank you. Um, I want to invite, let's have Navdeep, Alberto, and Tiana come back on camera. I'd love for um, us to, to close this, this session. I want to ask each of you, first, I want to say thank you for honoring us with your presence and trusting to share your story with us. Um, it's so powerful and taking us from the the, the advocate and, and more of the, the success story arc and, and then to where we see we're still striving and, and moving for things. You've, you've helped us better understand the, the gamut and, and why we need to do this and kind of what drives that, that uncertainty. But I, I want to give you the opportunity to, you know, take a minute or so, each of you, and tell us when you think about accelerated approval, Kind of what's that? And you may, I, as we talked, you may not have known about the regulatory structure, but when you think about accelerated approval, now that you know much more than you might have before, what is that word or phrase that you think of? What's the, the headline or the takeaway from accelerated approval that you want to share with our audience today? And now let me give you the order. Tiana, I'm going to let you go first. And then we'll go to Catherine, to Navdeep, and to Alberto. So, Tiana, would you give us your your headline or your sentence or your phrase? Yeah, sure. I think that um, my phrase would be life changing. Um, I think like everyone up here is a testament to you know with their personal experience and their community experience about the hope and the promise um, that lies within accelerated approval. <clears throat> Tiana, thank you. I've got, I'm, I'm writing these down because you all are gonna continue to inspire me. So I've got life-changing and hope. Um, Catherine, would you go next? Sure. Um, I would like to piggyback off um, Tiana's hope word. I wear a necklace um, that says hope. Um, every day just to remind me of that. Um, but my phrase is actually more time. Um, I just think about having more days um, to spend with my family and loved ones. More days and more time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Navdeep. Mine's would be um, freedom and shackle breaking. I mean, it was, you know, to no longer have to self-inject every single day and to just take a pill. It was a total freedom. I, I would just, you know, my, my nighttime routine was to do a big, big orchestra of medication making and injecting and just to pop a pill and go to sleep. It was, it was freedom and it was, it was shackle breaking, life changing. I'm echoing everything everyone's saying. You are providing your own voice, Navdeep, an important one in, in, in that power of um, the change in routine and the opportunities that that freedom provided you. So uh, in, an important additional voice. Um, Alberto, do you wanna to give us our, our phrase or what you think of when you think about accelerated approval? Make sure you unmute or we'll miss your phrase. You guys are so incredibly inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering all of my friends who aren't here and all of us who got into trouble, good trouble, trying to change the system and make it more responsive and how thrilled they would know that they would be, that what we, we changed has benefited you and continues to benefit others. They would be thrilled that they participated in all the studies. And mine, my catchphrase is determination. Determination on the part of the researchers, of the legislators, the directors, and yes, the patients to be determined to live. 
the four of you have phrased this all so well in in summing it up and 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 I think what a what a powerful picture and face on the structure that we heard about you know why why we need you know why Congress told FDA to pursue this and and also to make sure that you are um, make sure that that you know through accelerated approval that we follow up on it and you learn more and that you um, that we continue to advance in this space. So I again thank you to the four of you for joining us and reminding us why we have this authority and why we pursue it. Alberto for the trailblazing, Navdeep for the shackle breaking, Tiana for the uh, life changing hope, and Catherine for more days and more time. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. So uh, it is time for us to move to our, our third session, but I think we can all um, acknowledge that we have, uh, that was just powerful to help us understand as we move um, through and talk about the accelerated approval process. Um, our next segment is going to be speaking through more of this real world uh, reaction and kind of the understanding of, of how is it that accelerated approval, we've heard the FDA perspective, we've heard the direct patient care perspectives, and now we are going to turn to a fireside chat, albeit without fire and without being side by side, but we'll be collectively together um, on the Zoom call to have a collaborative discussion exploring the perspectives and experiences of the broader healthcare sector with accelerated approval. And so we have um, an opportunity, this is gonna be a no slide session, um, but we have invited our, we're gonna come on the on screen together. So I wanna invite um, our panelists to come on video, and I know we have three of our four, and um, if we have the opportunity to have our fourth panelist join us, we will, but who's gonna join us on video? First, for the healthcare professional perspective, we have Dr. Julie Grelo, who's Chief Medical Officer at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, from the patient advocate perspective, we welcome Kay Holcomb, who is board chair for the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Um, for the payer voice, we have Dr. Michael Sherman, Chief Medical Officer of Point32 Health, um, which is a combination of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Tufts Health Plan. And then I um, uh, want to just confirm if she has the opportunity to join, then we will add in Dr. Uh, Michelle McMurray Heath from Bio if she has the opportunity to join us. But I want to see, I've got my colleagues here on camera. Let's um, start the conversation, and I will tell you it took me um, a minute to come through those powerful stories. So, so Kay, as we pivot from, from the, those patient perspectives that were just shared, I, help us think about the patient advocate perspective, and what has the accelerated progr program meant to patient advocates, particularly in the rare disease space? Susan, thank you for asking that question and thank you for inviting the National Organization for Rare Diseases to be part of this conversation. It is an honor uh, to speak to you on behalf of those organizations and uh, NORD is an umbrella over many, many organizations that represent individual rare diseases. And I'm honored to um, give you my perspective and hope that I'm reflecting accurately their perspective as well. One of the things that um, patients with rare diseases are famously known for is um, their, what is so-called diagnostic odyssey. And that is that they have something wrong with them and no one knows what it is. And they spend days and weeks and months and years going from healthcare provider 
to internet websites, to Facebook groups, to everything else, trying to see if they can just figure out what's wrong with them. But even if they exit that diagnostic odyssey with a diagnosis, they then go into this, this next odyssey. They get on the therapeutic odyssey ship and then wait for that ship to land in a good place. And for a long time, uh, they have, and we all have, been arguing that there are so many differences between patients who have rare diseases and patients who have non-rare diseases that are well understood or better understood at least. And those patients with rare diseases recognize and have recognized for a long time that the tr traditional pathway to finding a therapy, having the FDA approve a therapy as safe and effective, um, it, it just doesn't work for them. The traditional clinical endpoint does not work for them. It takes too long. It's too difficult to put clinical trials together. They just can't do the research in the same way. These are patient populations that in many cases are so small that to get 50 of them in one place would require you to go across the entire globe, much less to get hundreds of them who are going to be able to go to clinical sites and participate in a clinical trial. So it was with great relief and cheers from the sidelines when FDA decided, thanks to Alberto and his colleagues in the HIV AIDS community, decided that maybe there could be a different pathway, a pathway that recognized that sometimes a traditional clinical trial wasn't possible and that a clinical trial that relied on a surrogate that hadn't been yet completely validated could be an alternative. And how could we make that work? And we, from the peanut gallery, were cheering them on as they figured out how could we make this work. Um, and obviously one of the ways is to define correctly what it is that we're thinking of doing, which is to look at a surrogate endpoint and make a determination based on existing data, data that's brought into the agency by the researcher or data that have been collected elsewhere and are in the literature, that there is a reasonable possibility, reasonable likelihood that this surrogate is going to predict a clinical benefit and a clinical outcome that is measurable and that is good for the patient. So um, we were launched on our, our therapeutic odyssey ship uh, and it was named Accelerated Approval. And we are, um, we're concerned right now on behalf of advocates for patients with rare diseases that accelerated approval is under fire. And what we hope will happen uh, is not that this just gets abandoned and throws, it gets thrown overboard, but that people think about what are the best ways of continuing this approach while ensuring everybody that what as patients with rare diseases want is the same thing you want, which is that the kinds of therapies that are available to patients are safe and they are effective. They actually work for the patient. We want that too. We don't want a lower standard. We don't want something that doesn't work just for the sake of taking a pill or an injection. We want to know that those therapies, which seem to us to be very helpful and may be individually helpful, really are proven to be helpful. And so that's why we believe that those follow-up studies that are required under the accelerated approval pathway are done and they are done well and they are done properly and they are done timely. 
Uh, so we are all in favor of making sure that we all collectively understand what these studies are going to be, when they're supposed to be finished, how they're going to be done. We'd like there to be a little more transparency and who's doing what and how are they doing doing that? Because there are ways that we as patients can be helpful. There are ways that we as advocates can be helpful. Uh, and I'd like to just close, I, I know my five minutes is probably drawing to a close, um, by mentioning the fact that NORD actually within this last year has done a white paper on accelerated approval. And it's called, if I get the name wrong, they'll kill me, I'll be fired. FDA's Accelerated Approval Pathway, A Rare Disease Perspective. And it, you can have a look at that uh, if by going to Nord's webpage and either looking under the news tab, which is on the far right, I am told, and clicking there and you will find this paper referenced right there at the top of the list. Or you can click on the um, advocacy issues tab. And again, that will bring you to a list of important advocacy issues of which this is the first one. And so that paper can be opened up and read. And NOR does make some specific recommendations about um, particularly how the, um, the follow-up trials can be done in a way that's transparent to patient groups, to patients themselves, to physicians that are treating patients. But accelerated approval has meant the difference for rare disease patients between life and death between life and a better life, between hope and despair, between determination and hopelessness. So every single patient who just told us their story is speaking for every single other patient who has a rare disease. And for us, the same words apply as did for all of them. And I wanna thank them for recognizing how much we all share and the determination to get this right and to do better every single day for patients is shared by every stakeholder, patients, patient advocates, healthcare providers, researchers in industry, researchers in academia. We all care about the same thing happening. So let's not throw the baby out the odyssey with the odyssey bath. And uh, let's, if there need to be changes, let's make them carefully and with determination. Thanks again for letting me share my thoughts. Hey, thank you. Thank you. And you, I, I caught two particular things, right, of importance in the rare disease that, that where it appears accelerated approval has an important role. One is, you know, just small numbers and the odyssey that you're on. And so the accelerated approval becomes important in, in being able to help explore some of the, those endpoints and to expand access sooner. And then the second point where you said, you know, as with, with all the patients here, you don't want false hope. So that commitment to the confirmatory trials and continuing to learn more. Um, are, the, uh, are those the two headlines I should have been yeah, gathering? Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think it's important also to recognize that accelerated approval is kind of a different, um, different thing than if you just look at the name and then you don't know the background, the wonderful background that FDA provided us today. Accelerated approval is more, it, it is not just about reducing the length of time an application spends on an FDA reviewer's desk. And it's not about reducing the standards and letting something slip out under the transom instead of over the transom. That's really not quite there yet. But accelerated approval goes to the heart of the therapy development matter, which is reducing the length of time it takes to get in the door at the FDA in a way that makes sense scientifically and by the data. Right, where you get to that, uh, that end point, that surrogate end point where you learn enough about it 
and then yes. you can speak to the predictive clinical benefit and then go, it's part of that um, def, uh, deliberate uncertainty. <laughs> so say we've, right. we've seen enough and how do we move that forward? Exactly. I want to invite, invite um, Julie, Michael, Michelle, anyone want to kind of chime in on the, the dynamics that Kay shared and particularly this, this kind of thinking about the, the surrogate endpoint and, and getting to that deliberate uncertainty. Julie? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we've heard was a very powerful testament to how just focusing on overall survival, adding years of life is not the only relevant endpoint to patients. There are very meaningful benefits that, that can occur short of that. Um, and getting promises, I like uh, the hope piece of it. Getting promising agents to patients sooner it, is a good thing. And patients can weigh the risks and benefits. You know, they can accept uh, the, that there's a risk that you might not know as much about a drug. And they deserve to be able to be in the position of weighing from their personal opinion the risks and benefits of having access to an earlier drug. Yes. Really and, helpful. Michelle or Michael? Yeah, um, just an observation. So, um, you know, payers um, are really good at evaluating um, drugs for common conditions, high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol lowering, heart disease. Um, they're very familiar with the endpoints. But for many of the rare disease that impact um, so many Americans, and my understanding is from actually from NORD that it is, it's about 8% of Americans. So collectively, they're not rare, even though they may be rare individually. Um, this It's hard, for, you know, payers don't have enough experience. They don't intuitively understand what's important and what isn't. So it, it actually is critical that we have the, the groups, uh, the patient groups and others helping inform and educate us so that we don't um, make the wrong decisions in terms of, of ensuring coverage and access. That's a yeah. great dynamic, Michael. Yeah, Michelle, please jump in. Well, absolutely moving um, remarks, Kay, and I really appreciate it. I think what we have is an antiquated system that was designed to protect patients from being in clinical trials. You know, our modern FDA is harkens back to a day where the being in a clinical trial was the last resort. It was often disempowered patients that didn't have full consent that were being experimented on in a way that perhaps wasn't to their own best interest. We have come a complete 180 degrees. Today, your best hope, if you have a serious life-threatening disease, is to get access to a clinical trial. Your hope of getting cutting edge treatments that have the ability to make a difference where nothing else can exists only in those clinical trials and with those experimental therapies. And that is why we saw patients storming the barricades during the HIV epidemic demanding accelerated approval because they knew that their life depended on getting quicker access to these very uh, um, evolutionary therapies. But that is not what we have set up our system to do. And so now we have to stop letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have to start giving patients access to hope, opportunity, and survival. And that's what accelerated approval accomplishes. Now, of course, we need safeguards. Of course, we need to make sure that we are using our best science, but science has evolved to such a point that we have very good predictive measures very early on in our clinical testing to know whether something is likely to be safe and likely to be hopeful and successful. And so we need to depend on that scientific knowledge and give more patients access. And this is important in, in the rare disease space. It's also incredibly important if we want health equity and better diversity um, in who gets access to cutting edge therapies. Because we know the clinical trial system we have set up today is overwhelmingly white and male. And because of the exclusion criteria, not it's people think, oh, well, we just have to put a little bit more forethought into it. And yes, if you spend more money and take more time, you can diversify your trials. But that neglects the fact that we have um, non-diversity sewn into the fabric of randomized controlled placebo trials because we insist on the purity of the data. 
And the purity of the data means a homogenous sample that has less complexity and that forbids access to so many diverse populations. So we have to realize that accelerated approval is giving hope and access to so many others that would be excluded from it were it not available. Dr. McMurray, he thank you for that. It, it amplifies, you know, what we heard from Alberto in the, the HIV experience of there, you know, had folks who couldn't travel to it. But here, um, it's not just about location, but it is about uh, breaking through those silos that we've built that have, have created a system where we, we, we simply don't have health equity. And so I guess it's another dynamic of accelerated approval when you expand that access. It helps us uh, drive change in yeah. that inequitable structure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, people neglect the fact that our Alzheimer's trials over the last 10 years on average have been 95% white. So even along the clinical trial spectrum, they've been incredibly non-diverse. And it's not because of callousness, it's because if you look at the exclusion criteria, they exclude cardiovascular disease, they exclude um, history of cerebral vascular disease, and many of them require patients to have a dedicated full-time caretaker that can attend to their needs. I can't think of a 70 or 80 year old African-American patient who would meet those three criteria, no matter how hard you look for them. And that, but that's what it takes to get very pristine data. And we need to get off of that high horse and figure out how we help more patients. Yeah, it's a, it, we often have said, you know, randomized controlled trials are not real life, but then that means that some of these things where we're learning more aren't available in real life to the, the broader, broader community. Really, really helpful. Um, I wanna turn to, to Dr. Grelo. Um, you're here for our standing in the healthcare professional's shoes um, and kind of that the player in determining how and when a patient would access a product made available under accelerated approval because you, you hold the prescriber role. Um, tell us how clinicians think about surrogate endpoints and, and even more generally, how do clinicians think about products made available under accelerated approval? Thanks, Susan. And, and since I'm representing providers or prescribers, um, uh, I personally practiced as a breast medical oncologist and a clinical trialist for more than 25 years. So I can speak directly to the impact of accelerated approval on my patients. I also um, am assumed the role of the chief medical officer at ASCO this past year, the American Society of Clinical Oncology which is a professional organization of oncology specialists. And so I can speak on behalf of our professional organization and say that ASCO strongly supports the accelerated approval process, primarily because it provides patients with cancer with the earliest possible access to potentially life-threatening therapy and hope. Um, as we heard from Dr. Mehta, accelerated approvals are really incredibly important in oncology. Um, oncology accounts for about 85% of accelerated approvals. And for the recent oncology approvals, um, a third were initially an accelerated approval. So it's a very important mechanism in oncology. And as we've talked about throughout uh, the, this whole chat, um, accelerated approval is a balance. It's a balance between how much uncertainty do we have about the effectiveness and the side effects versus benefit and the early access for the patients. And the risks and benefits will differ across diseases, across stage of disease, across the indications. So the risks are that the earlier treatment is available, the less safety information might exist, the less efficacy information, we're not certain it really works. And earlier approval or access may make it harder to complete the confirmatory trials to get full approval because it's out there already. So you can't get people to enroll in the trial. The benefits in oncology are clear. They provide patients with early access to potentially life-saving therapy instead of requiring them to wait for confirmation of longer-term endpoints. And let's talk about that. You asked about the endpoints and Dr. Corrigan Carre overviewed endpoints. So Accelerated approval is by definition based on what we call surrogate endpoints. 
intermediate measures considered reasonably likely to predict the stronger clinical outcomes. So overall survival is the gold standard in oncology, the ultimate endpoint. Um, does the treatment increase how long the patient lives? So that's the gold standard. But surrogate endpoints in oncology can include things like reducing the size of the tumor or delaying the time to progression or recurrence. So giving more time uh, before a recurrence or progression. And in a setting where there's no approved drug, just knowing that a promising new therapy can have a response, meaning it can shrink the tumor, that can be a reasonable surrogate when there aren't other options. And in cancers where overall survival is very long and patients can live a long time with their disease on treatment for their disease, then progression-free survival, how long does the treatment hold the cancer in check without growing again? That can be a very reasonable surrogate. And Tiana's example of the benefit of just giving me more good days, the impact of treatment on quality of life, that could be considered a, a meaningful surrogate endpoint too. So we do have, besides accelerated approval, we do have another mechanism to get promising drugs to patients sooner, something called expanded access. We sometimes call that compassionate use. But this is much more clumsy, much harder to do. Um, you can kind of apply to get access to a promising treatment for a patient with a life-threatening condition or a serious disease outside of a clinical trial if there aren't alternative therapies. But it's not generally compensated. Uh, it's very, you have to get it approved across many levels uh, and many smaller cancer clinics and community practices just don't have the mechanism to be able to do a one by one by one patient request for approval and then getting access to the drug and, and it's experimental drug. So it can't go through the neural processes and getting the institutional review board to review. So I just don't feel that practical. I've done it, uh, but it's it's not practical. And with accelerated approval, far more patients will get access to the treatment when it becomes commercially available. And we've had a lot of talk about these post-marketing requirements and some concern over the regulatory structure for how do we review and what's the criteria, the timeline for withdrawing approval. And I mean, what, what we heard from Dr. Mehta is that in oncology, we've had a relatively small number of withdrawals of accelerated approvals of drugs that didn't later confirm the clinical benefit. And if it had been zero, then they should have all gotten full approval in the first place, right? And we talked a lot about these dangling approvals when the trials to confirm aren't conducted in a timely manner or they don't confirm intended clinical benefit. But when, when the drugs whose clinical benefit isn't confirmed um, and we get withdrawal, I just want to state that should not be a failure of the process. Having some withdrawals is expected and it's a trade-off for getting exciting drugs available early. And a failed trial doesn't always mean a failed drug. It just might mean a very poorly designed trial. Um, the wrong endpoint, the statistical power and other statistics or an inability to select a subset of patients that were in the overall trial who really are benefiting versus another subset who aren't. So, you know, those are my thoughts. I'm excited about the transparency in the Oncology Center of Excellence uh, in Project Confirm uh, that we heard about. I'm excited about the new innovative clinical trial designs, less single arm trials, more randomized trials where um, the, a trial at an early endpoint can get a preliminary approval and accelerated approval, and that same trial can actually lead to the longer term endpoint. So um, my thoughts as a provider. Uh, Julie, thank you. And you, you captured, I think, a, an important point for us that if we're if all of the products made available under accelerated approval then moved to approval, we're probably we might be being it seems like there wouldn't be much uncertainty there, right? That maybe our 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 uh, box of uncertainty is too small um, that we, we would assume that that looking at those surrogate endpoints, some of them are not going to to meet the standard. And then the back to the access component that Dr. McMurray Heath mentioned, um, you know that 
Um, expanded access is a good way for a one-off and one patient, but but not. It, it really is uh, more of a singular approach than accelerated approval and putting it into the armament, armamentarium of oncologists to to pursue. Compassionate um, use is bespoke, and bespoke is always expensive and, and rare. <laughs> so we have to keep that in mind. Right. Right, and so it's it's a uh, a possibility, but by no means a substitute. Right, it's it's another of the tools and the things that could be could be done. Um, a couple that came up in our patient panel and has has come up here a bit too on the the payer perspective. Uh, Dr. Sherman, I wanna I wanna make sure that we hear more about the the payer dynamic and. And you've been at the forefront of some of the most talked about pay for performance programs for drugs and biologics and, and leading the way on real world evidence generation. Um, how do payers look at the last 30 years of accelerated approval? Yeah, um, and uh, Susan, thank you for the chance to be here. I think it's an important topic. And, and let me acknowledge from the get-go that I think payers probably have a bad reputation here broadly. Um, when patient advocacy groups talk about payers and physicians, the first thing that comes to mind is there are the people saying no who are making hard to get what I want. And, and I think we need to get beyond that. And the, the reality is, and, and I think you've shown this here, um, the data, the patient journeys, et cetera, um, these drugs are, are transformational more and more uh, the reaction among payers should be not how do we say no, but how do we say yes? And uh, and, and really that's a crux of it. Um, the, the, the fact though that payers do have a lot of questions, as I alluded to earlier, uh, for many of the rare disease patients, uh, or excuse me, payers don't have a lot of experience understanding what's impactful and what isn't, and they need to depend on others. And it's about having the right endpoints and also understanding what is not just statistically, but clinically significant. So is a 1% um, increase in a certain measure, um, a blood level of a protein or something um, meaningful. It may be statistically um, significant, but we don't understand if it's meaningful. So um, there, there's often a lack of knowledge there, and we need help being informed. Um, second, um, and, and I think you alluded to this, um, clinical trials are done in very, very uh, carefully done settings with uh, you know, um, really carefully selected patients, physicians who um, are, are reading or wrote the playbook, and who see a lot of patients of those type. Everyone is followed by a clinical research associate, um, and and you know, and one of the downsides here, and it's not just Alzheimer's, but for so many. Um, trials, they're not done in populations that represent what the broad populations appear to be. So for those reasons, payers sometimes are skeptical. Now, the, the, the again, the, the truth is where we're seeing drugs for unmet need, delaying means lives. And we should want to see more drugs for unmet need rather than another Me Too drug for diabetes or, um, or other uh, conditions where there already may be a plethora. So um, that, that is important. So we need to get beyond that. And one of the questions I've asked is how do we create that access? How do we, spit, how do we provide real world evidence? And what we've done in cases for, um, for drugs and, and also for precision diagnostics, where there is a lot of, um, I would say, confusion and inconsistent policies, is try to figure out how do we how do we help generate uh, that real world evidence, and how do we do it in a way which is fair to all parties, and you know, and also creates a minimal financial risk for our stakeholders. So what we've done is a number of agreements for new drugs where we've agreed to facilitate and broaden access. And um, in our population, in return, we there generally is some sort of risk agreement that if the drug doesn't do what it's supposed to, what it was approved for, the manufacturer is taking some financial risk. So they're eliminating the concern among payers. Um, what if there is poor value? And in doing so, you not only come out with a financial risk agreement, I mean, I frankly, I think that's usually the headline, but that's not really the most important part. The most important part is now we're introducing something into a broad unmanaged population out into the wild with physicians who don't do trials all day, but who actually are involved day to day in busy practices with all different types of patients. And the, that evidence truly is real world and be used by us and frankly, hopefully by others across the country to make more informed decisions. So we're, we're proud to be 
able to doing that to be able to do that. And, and there's so much opportunity. Um, we recently announced um, that we are covering the Grail test for a very limited population in a similar way. Um, there's a lot of confusion about how a pan cancer screening test might work, but also tremendous promise. Let's work together to try to put, uh, to put out that data and determine what makes sense. So, um, and, and so I, I, you know, in addition to the concerns I mentioned about um, what is, what is meaningful and is the data indicative of what happens in the real world, payers worry about value. And one aspect of, of this system is when these drugs are approved um, frequently for a, a completely um, unmet need, which again is what we want to see, there's no constraint on what they can charge. And, and some um, manufacturers are very responsible, um, others less so. So when you have um, questions about how broad and how robust the data is with uh, what is what may be perceived as an inappropriately high price, payers tend to be concerned. Let me also share that, and again, we are a payer with 2.2 million members, probably somewhat typical. We serve Medicare where you know, we may bear the risk, but if costs go up, ultimately it falls to the beneficiary to the government. Uh, we have half a million Medicaid members. And again, that is really um, goes to the state, which have to manage a balanced budget. And even on the commercial side, there's been a, a trend over past years for, for employers to go from fully to self-insured. So, which means instead of writing the um, insurance company check for $500 or whatever a month, they write us a check for $30 or $40 or whatever that fee is, and they pay the claims directly. And, and with that number increasing, uh, for our commercial population, 67% of the, that membership is through self-insured. So when, when there are costs without any benefit, it's the employers uh, who, are, who are feeling that directly. So we need to be good stewards of the healthcare dollar. Um, and again, the best way to, to assure that is to work together to start with fair pricing uh, through some benchmark or showing your work or whatever, and for going to risk, uh, going at risk for the endpoints. I think it's completely reasonable to ask the manufacturers to go at risk of the same endpoints that they promise will work and are using to get the drug approved, at least in these kind of settings until there's more evidence. And I think if we can work together like this, we can balance access and affordability and, and really bring more drugs to market. I always, my litmus test is always knowing what I know, um, what would you want for yourself or a member of your family? And, and more and more it would be to have access to these. So it's important to be a part of the solution. And being part of that solution, I think you, you pointed out, it's, it, you too want to, you want to know more about that surrogate endpoint. Mm -hmm. and and what it means uh and then you also want to generate help help if possible generate the data to say does this work do you know we, yes. we're all trying mm -hmm. to navigate that uncertainty and payers want that uncertainty uh, uncertain they want us to get through the valley of uncertainty as well is that Yes, the, yeah, the, the best way to get through that is eliminate all of the, the access to barriers. So let's say there is a new treatment that comes out for something like Alzheimer's, a new drug. Let's not rehash the past here. Uh, let's say that, um, again, the, what's been studied is, um, is plaque, is amyloid, where I think we've learned there is not complete agreement. Um, what and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there as a hypothetical. What if a manufacturer said to the payers, please cover this approved drug? Um, we won't send you a bill um, unless they not only have a reduction in plaque, but if they have a certain improvement in cognitive performance, you know, which is really the point here. If, if someone were to do that, that would eliminate all barriers on the part of the payers and all concerns and would actually create a very large real world experiment, which would, would tell us at the end of the day, what, how does this really translate it into real world results? Does it matter? Mm -hmm. so, so Susan, can I Please. jump in there? Because one, I think it's incredibly important that we're having this clarifying conversation because accelerated approval gets um, confused with a coverage decision. Accelerated approval is an FDA purview and FDA is by statute, not supposed to be considering the cost of the pharmaceutical. It's supposed to be judging whether or not for a significant patient population, there's the opportunity for the benefits to outweigh the risks of the therapy, period. The rest of the conversation is something we should have quite separately and distinct. Uh, now, I agree that value conversation is also incredibly important, but we have to always be looking with the same aperture. 
So a lot of our companies in bio, we represent over a thousand biopharma companies, are very excited about the opportunity for value-based um, agreements. But we also have to make sure that we're looking at it at the population level. Um, you know, the speaker mentioned that they should have the same endpoints that they have in their FDA trials, but FDA trials are looked at at a population level, not at an individual patient level. And so while meeting the same endpoints and goals in your trials at the population level is completely to be expected and should be demanded, meeting it for each individual patient is something that's just scientifically um, impossible to achieve. So we have to make sure we're striking the right balance. And when we talk about what is the value of a breakthrough therapy for an individual patient, we also need to have a very robust conversation as a society about what models we're using to judge that value. Because it's, it's you know, commonly accepted that many of the value assessment tools that we're using right now in the US tend to underestimate the needs of minority communities. They tend to underestimate the needs of patients with chronic diseases. They tend to underestimate the impact on families when you have an individual with a longstanding chronic illness. And they tend to look at a very short time parameter rather than the impact over time. And so we really do need to have a very important debate about what is the proper way to measure the value of a treatment. And the other thing we have to, to talk about, which we never discuss, is the value of innovation. Um, you know, our companies launched over a thousand research and development programs targeted at COVID, 181 vaccine development programs. We have around the globe now roughly 10 that have made it to the market of COVID vaccines. Um, and no one talks about the cost of paying for those other 170 research and development programs that fail to ever produce um, a commercial product. And yet I am so glad that we had 181 vaccine development programs because if we had, if the odds pickers had started at the beginning as to which ones they thought would win the race and be effective, they would have been completely wrong, zero for zero. So science is not predictable and yet we need robust science. So we need to come together while shielding patients completely from out of pocket costs. We at the same time need to figure out how we're gonna to come together as a society to pay for the innovations that patients so desperately need. Which is a really helpful connection, right? In the um, distinguishing the FDA process, which then yields decisions for Michael and the other payers to make. So they've got to understand and kind of think about how they think through that separate decision-making process. But I, I think there's a power here between actually among the patient, the provider, the payer and, and industry to be saying when you have, you know, in an accelerated approval environment, we're all trying to get through that valley of uncertainty and do that confirmatory trial. Uh, the idea of, um, you know, empowering and gathering the real world evidence um, that is generated in that payer scenario, I think is, is intriguing. Uh, Dr. Sherman, I saw you unmute. You and I. Yeah, no, I, I just think those are generally points I would agree with, and, and we need the right models. Um, the, the problem is that if we do have high prices that are not commensurate with the value provided, payers across the country will try to limit access, which, which is bad for patients, which is what we should be thinking about. Um, the, the other point I would make is, you know, for, again, for state Medicaid agencies, the, you know, that's, for them, it's a choice. Do we pay a teacher? Uh, do we build a bridge or do we pay for a drug? And you're, you're, you know, it's, it's not an unlimited budget. So we need to think about being fair to everyone, including the companies doing this cutting edge research because it is high risk and we do want dollars to flow to those companies. I, I would also argue that we need some sort of objective assessment. So let, let's agree it shouldn't even be the payers making that decision, but whether it's ICER, which has come up as an impromptu assessment entity in, uh, that is unofficial in this uh, kind country or others are showing their work, it is important. And, and the Un reason- Unofficial uh, let me just point and other, unaccountable. <laughs> but, well, you know, they, they have farm at the table. And I will share with you that a number of pharma companies have gone to ICE early and said, look at our drug, tell us what it's worth. And we'll price it there because there's empirical evidence showing that when they do that, payers say, 
it's a great value. Let's let's um, provide for that. But the other point I want to make, um, if I may, is that the risk in not having these assessment frameworks is payers will have a knee jerk response. And that is, if they look at the price without the value, they may say that a hundred dollar drug is preferable to a thousand dollar drug. Yet if you look at the thousand dollar drug, which may extend life more, keep people out of the hospital, it may be the right decision. So the risk is without having that framework, payers will make the wrong decision and they'll make inconsistent decisions since they may use their own models. Mm -hmm. Completely agree that that it needs to be out of the hands of both manufacturers and payers. It needs to be independent, um, but it should be driven by the patient voice um, because patients can tell us best what's the value that they, that they really need and, and desire. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, helpful to think about the intersection of the FDA process and then the subsequent payer piece, as well as this promise of potentially more data. I want to help us in our last uh, um, 15 minutes or so here to talk a little bit. We, we haven't yet heard, uh, Michelle, I want to turn to you to, to say, you know, without your members, and you, you mentioned this, you know, without research and development, um, FDA wouldn't have anything to review. Doctors and patients wouldn't have those therapies to consider. Um, Michael would have less to evaluate in his payer decisions. Um, So how does regulated industry think about accelerated approval? And and in particular, um, you know, we talked a lot about we really want to see those confirmatory trials conducted. (laughs) Um, how does regulated industry think about this pathway and navigating it and, and the important components there? Yes. So, you know, it, it's so interesting to me. I, I just was at the launch of Albert Borla's book um, about the COVID vaccine um, process, and he was talking about how he was so driven um, to try to find solutions for illness because of his um, parents who had survived the Holocaust and how they really pointed him in the direction of solving impossible problems. It's, it was so moving. I, um, but there are so many people like that in our industry. And I think what saddens me the most as both a scientist and a physician and someone who's had the opportunity to be both in FDA and in industry is the presumption that companies are not trying to get to the answer. I think we need confirmatory trials. I think companies want to have that um, complete assurance that they know from beginning to end that their products are helping the patients that they intend to help. Um, But in the accelerated approval context, the science is evolving incredibly rapidly. Um, I remember once overseeing a trial where we were being asked to confirm a trial where the science had surpassed that product and it was no longer actually the preferred clinical choice. What is the ethical responsibility of completing a clinical trial when the science has moved past it and the science has already said that there are other options that are better for patients. Is it better to keep on enrolling that trial and exposing patients to that clinical option where it may be good for a small subpopulation but not good for patients overall? Or is it better to say, let's move on and figure out what the next breakthrough is and what is the next evolutionary step we need to take? And if you look at the HIV example, Um, we constantly saw an iteration of new and um, incredibly improving drugs at each iteration. And that's what we want to see. That should be our benchmark. That and um, the withdrawal rate of accelerated approval products not outstripping that of normal approval. And that's what we see. I think in the normal approval process for the last 10 years, the withdrawal rate has been around 5%. And in accelerated approval, it's been about 7%. So it's not like accelerated approval is letting through floodgates opening of unsafe products, it's that it's giving patients access to incredibly cutting edge science quicker than, than it would otherwise. And cutting edge science that we can then continue to navigate and answer those questions that we didn't have Sci- answered. Science yeah. is iterative. And so right. we should be taking, if we are really moving to a model of real world data, which we should, real world data that is actionable immediately, then we should be capturing the data as we go. We should know as immediately as possible whether we're seeing adverse events that we were not expecting or we're seeing a decrease in efficacy that we were not expecting. And then we should pivot. We should not be wedded to a clinical protocol. We should be pivoting to the next great iteration based upon that knowledge. Um, And we have to strike that balance. We need to make sure that innovators are fulfilling their commitments, 
but we also need to not stand on formalities in letting the science um, stampede ahead. Uh, science stampeding ahead makes me think of speed, which is one of the components, the accelerated part of accelerated approval. And, and we know that speed can make people nervous. We certainly heard that, you know, in consumer reaction and questions about the development of a, of a COVID-19 vaccine. I, I want to give each of you the opportunity to, to share, how do you think about the accelerated part of accelerated approval and, and how the FDA and industry and providers and payers kind of maintain that high standard of review while also moving quickly. What, what, what strikes you about that moving fast part? And you've touched on it a bit, but who, who wants to unmute first and, and provide a quick response there? I'll, you've got I'll it, jump Julie. In. <laughs> okay, ahead, that's Julie. all right. Go ahead, Michelle, and then Julie's next. Well, I'll just say I was, I was with John Crowley, who is a, a patient's father turned innovator. Um, of a rare disease and he, his company was able to come up with a cure that had saved two of his children. And he said to me, you know, if you are battling a rare disease or um, a terminal diagnosis, time is the enemy. And I think that is so clear. When you talk about fear of speed, that is not usually coming from patients who are struggling with a life-threatening illness. That is coming maybe from payers, maybe from regulators, um, maybe from public sitting on the sidelines, but it's not coming from the patients and the families that are desperate for a solution. And so we need to keep that in context. COVID vaccines are unique because you're giving a product to a healthy population. That's a distinct situation. But in most cases, when we're talking about accelerated approval, we're talking about something that is desperately needed and that people are waiting for. Julie. So, uh, you know, our understanding of cancer and its treatment is just changing every day. It's accelerating the amount of new information, the number of new targets, the number of new drugs um, under study. And our regulatory systems need to be able to respond and adapt in ways that meet this rapidly evolving science, um, you know, so that we can deliver cutting edge treatments quickly to patients and appropriately balance safety at risk. So the accelerated approval process works. It's not perfect. Um, you know, we can absolutely make some changes to make sure it's possible to complete those post-approval confirmatory trials and, you know, knock off the few that don't meet the criteria. But um, we need to support it. It's working. And, it, and the accelerated approval process has now been around since the early HIV AIDS days. It, it has evolved and it's continuing to evolve and we need to support that. So we better meet the needs of our patients. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I would, again, nothing here I would disagree with. Um, there, there was just such poignant stories about people for whom delay means lives. Um, that, you know, that speaks for itself. Um, the important thing is to have a robust process as we do for validating afterwards and, and proceeding with full approval or, or, or withdrawal. And um, as you've, you know, demonstrated that that's fairly robust. So um, I think we're all on the same page here. And I, and I, um, I think it's important to remember that our focus traditionally, I suppose, has been on speeding up the review of an application. So something has happened, it's handed into the FDA. Let's make the FDA do it in 10 months instead of 12. Let's make them do it in six months instead of eight. Let's make them do it in five minutes. Um, but this is about something that everybody acknowledges as a problem, which is drug development is too long and it's too costly and it's too difficult. And what accelerated approval is about is about recognizing that there may be a way to get into that development process itself and then 
quote unquote, accelerate it or shorten it, and then prove later if you've really made a big miscalculation. But it isn't like somebody can walk in the door with something they've scooped out of their bathtub and say, you know, this cured three of the guys on my block. Um, there are data that are required to demonstrate this reasonably likelihood that we're looking for. It's reasonably likely to predict a clinical benefit. So reasonable, uh, FDA knows what that word means, I, I, I can assure you. But I think anything that we can do to understand how to intervene in the development process itself, particularly in the longest and most expensive part of it, which is phase three clinical trials, um, we ought to be thinking about doing it and doing it well, obviously, doing it carefully, uh, doing it responsibly so that we can say to patients, yes, this is reasonably likely to work for you. We are going to prove this within the next two years by some additional studies we're gonna be doing. And there are now so many ways that we on the outside, as, as Dr. McMurray Keith has just said that we can bring in and, and understand how to use real world evidence, but there are also ways that patients are bringing real world evidence to bear. Patient registries, natural histories of diseases, these are all real world pieces of information that can be built upon and added to so that we can say we can move from reasonably likely to, yes, this does predict a clinical benefit. And Kay, Kay, I am so glad yep, you like, hit, hit on that point of, let us like take a breath and ask ourselves, are we doing clinical trials the way we should be doing them? You know, I, I've had um, company leaders say to me, you know, clinical trials are 90% of the time and 90% of the cost. Of, of developing a new drug. So if you wanna talk about how to make um, innovations more within the financial reach of, of more and more um, payers, let's try to use the science, the big, the IT, the big data, the real world evidence um, tools that we have at our disposal today to evolve that into something that's faster, cheaper, and safer. To me, I think it's a crime that actually for our COVID vaccines, for example, we you agreed with absolutely every conclusion of the Israeli data, the Israeli real world data on COVID vaccines along the way. That means that our huge trials that we paid for in all those other settings actually added no scientific information that was incremental to, to those studies, those early studies. So we need to ask ourselves, are we being redundant? Are we being wasteful? Are we putting more patients at risk? Because the main difference for really sick patients between saying, come into this phase three clinical trial of 10,000 patients versus accelerated approval after 2,000 patients and we'll continue to collect data is really who pays for it. Um, because there's calculated risk in both of those situations and which patients get access to it. So you've all helped us kind of come through the story of, of uh, why we would pursue accelerated approval, uh, you know, the, the patient reminding us of doing this in an area of unmet need. Kay, I think you captured it really brilliantly in the idea that this is not about making FDA move faster, but rather about saying where are there points in the research and development process that we can broaden access and then continue to learn, broaden our ability to learn, um, and, and Julie and Michael from the professional and the payer perspective, thinking through how do, we, how do we incorporate and put the context around accelerated approval. Um, but I wanna give each of you a final word. So you now are going to have 30 seconds to one minute to say, thinking about all of the conversation that we heard today, um, sometime this weekend or next week when you think back to what you did on a Friday afternoon and uh, you something's gonna come to mind and you're gonna say, oh, yes, you know, it was 
Navdeep's powerful story about having his infusion in his arm or um, the, the power of Tiana and the, and the other patients or, or thinking through this idea of uh, earlier, of, of accelerated approval being about access and equity. Um, I'm gonna turn to each of you and let me tell you the order that I'm gonna go in and then we will be right at the end of our time. So I'm gonna go Kay, Michelle, Julie, Michael, and I'm gonna keep you to under a minute each. Kay, what are you gonna remember from this afternoon? But you have to unmute or we won't be able to hear you. I'm gonna to remember to turn off my mute button. Um, I'm gonna remember that rare disease patients need and deserve for all of us to be looking for ways to make their access to safe and effective therapies more quickly and more, more quickly. Excellent, more thanks quicker. Kay. I think quicker. I have the adverb in the wrong place. We'll confirm and tie it down <laughs> in, the, in the recording. Michelle. <laughs> Okay, you've been so eloquent. I don't think anyone is worried about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to remember how hard it is not to conflate the issues between making a regulatory decision about whether patients should have access to a therapy or how we're going to pay for it. Um, because we keep conflating the two and they are distinct questions, both important, but not related. Helpful. And we did some conflating earlier with kind of conflating was a failed confirmatory trial, a failure of the drug or a failure of the trial and needing to distinguish that. So conflating might be end up being my, my word. Um, I was gonna do Julie and then Michael. Does that work, Julie? Yeah. So I think what I'm gonna remember from this more than anything is the very powerful stories from the patients that we heard today. Um, you know, that's what's sticking in my mind. That's what's impacted me most. And, how you know patients might not be alive to get access in a year or two. Um, we 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 know that the process isn't perfect, but we are getting promising drugs to our patients sooner, and that is giving them hope. And I'm going to be keeping a careful eye on two new bills that were just introduced into Congress this week uh, to give the FDA some additional tools to advance this pathway, and I'm going to commit to working with the FDA and all of you on helping keep this process in place, but evolve it and make it even better. Thank you, Julie. Michael. And, you know, I actually had the same thought as Julie did. Um, it's a patient stories, you know, that you have different stakeholder groups um, that don't always get along together. Um, and there are probably good and bad examples of um, patient advocacy groups and biotech companies and payers, but, you know, being here together, hearing those stories, hearing the strength and humility uh, that, that were shown. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if anyone checked their email during different parts here, but not, not during those stories, it was compelling. And it's a reminder why we're all here and why we need to work together. So, um, I, you know, I just, um, I, I really was humbled hearing them. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, we've come through our arc of telling the story about accelerated approval from the FDA perspective, the patient perspective, and then this chat to help us put all together. Dr. Corrigan Karai, could I turn to you to close it out, close out our discussion yeah. of deliberate uncertainty? Yes, well, yes, thank you. And wow, what an afternoon. I really can thank everyone enough for joining us and Susan for your just wonderful moderation. You know, we started with our perspective, FDA is navigating regulatory standards and procedures, and I know at times that could be a bit arcane. And so then we were followed by such moving personal experiences from our courageous patients, Mr. Rubio, Dr. Singh, Ms. Wolford, and Ms. Kuvayong. And then we heard from our next panelists just now on the importance of accelerated approval to provide access when we use our best science and ideas, and maybe we can improve how we find our confirmatory um, data. And I want to emphasize something that Kay noted, that accelerated approval does not mean that FDA accelerates its review. We give it the same attention as any application, and that we need to know that we have the scientific evidence to meet our framework. And we know there's going to be challenges, and we know there will be failures. That's inherent in a reasonably likely standard. And it's sometimes in our nature to focus on where we come up short. 
And while we should not, and I'm going to use another D in this, in this theme, dismiss our failures. And as Dr. Maida notes, we learn even from our failures. We need to continue in our disciplined way to get that data that patients and clinicians need. And there may be improvements we can make, and the Oncology Center of Excellence is providing more transparency. But importantly, we need to continue to embrace our deliberate uncertainty when the science is there because it is such, it's so important that we continue to give Mr. Rubio, Dr. Singh, Ms. Wolford, Ms. Kulvian, and many, many others the new therapies that will provide hope, break shackles, allow freedom to live their lives, and importantly, provide them more days. So with those thoughts, I'd like to thank you again for joining us and wish you all a wonderful week. 